Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the City Council Chambers. I am Council Member Vanessa Gibson, and I am proud to serve as the Chair of the Subcommittee on Capital, uh, and I am filling in this afternoon for our distinguished Chair of Public Housing, Chair Alika Ampri samuel who unfortunately could not join us this afternoon um, due to a family matter. I ask all of us to keep her and her family uh, in your prayers, um, and I am proud to step in and fill her shoes and chair today's budget hearing on the mayor's preliminary budget on uh, the Committee on Public Housing. So I thank you all for being here. Today's hearing this afternoon is on the city's fiscal 2021 preliminary budget hearing and NYCHA's five-year operating and capital plans for 2020 to 2024. I thank my colleagues who are here. Uh, I will recognize the members of the committee and council members who are here. We have council member Jimmy Van Bramer, council member Ruben Diaz Sr., council member Carlina Rivera, and council member Diana Ayala, who have joined us and others will be joining us throughout the afternoon. The New York City Housing Authority has operated the largest public housing program in the nation for over 75 years, providing affordable housing to nearly 400,000 low and moderate income New York City residents and families and serving nearly 200,000 additional New Yorkers through its Section 8 program. While NYCHA continues to be a precious and critical resource in an increasingly unaffordable city, long-standing disinvestment and federal underfunding of public housing coupled with organizational mismanagement has resulted in the deteriorate, deterioration of public housing. For years, many tenants and families have reported health and safety issues in their homes, ranging from lack of heat, hot water, unresolved mold issues, pest infestations, lead-based paint hazards, elevator outages, leaky roofs, and that's just to name a few of many of our long-standing issues. Recently, though, these health and safety issues have come to a head and the federal government stepped in through an administrative agreement that was signed last January, which requires NYCHA to remediate living conditions at developments citywide by specific deadlines. In total, the city is providing $2.2 billion from fiscal 2019 to fiscal 2028 for critical repairs to meet the terms of the agreement. And last February, a federal monitor was appointed to oversee these improvements and reform efforts at NYCHA. While city funding is a critical resource for NYCHA, it is a drop in the bucket compared to NYCHA's overall capital need of $32 billion, which can potentially increase to as much as 68 billion dollars by 2028. NYCHA, to its credit, is not solely relying on its government partners to rescue it from financial insolvency. The authority has implemented NYCHA 2.0, a comprehensive 10-year plan to renovate and preserve NYCHA developments and resolve $24 billion in capital needs across its portfolio. While NYCHA 2.0 is a big and bold plan, it still leaves about $9 billion unfunded capital needs across its portfolio and does not account for the fact that NYCHA's capital need could as much as double by the end of the 10-year plan. In addition, major components of the success of the NYCHA 2.0 plan heavily rely on funding resources available at the federal level, which the Trump administration has proposed severe reductions to or either complete zeroing out in the budget. At today's hearing this afternoon, it is our hope to understand and get a clearer understanding of how the NYCHA 2.0 plan will roll out, how NYCHA will improve the fiscal conditions of its buildings under the provision of a federal monitor, and how all of this translates to improved services for residents and families. 
after the New York City Housing Authority, we will hear from members of the public. I'd like to remind everyone, anyone who is here today that is interested in testifying, to please fill out our witness slip with the Sergeant at Arms to your right um, so that we can add you onto our list. I'd also like to thank and recognize the staff of the Committee on Public Housing for all of their work, our principal financial analyst, Sarah Gastelum, our unit head, Chima Obi Chair. Certainly want to thank the Finance Division, led by our director, LaTanya McKinney, and our deputy directors, Nathan Told, Paul Simone, Regina Pareda Ryan, and certainly want to acknowledge again our chair of public housing, Alika Ampri Samuel, and her staff. And I want to thank our chair for all of her work and her efforts. And certainly, while she may not be here phys physically, she's always here in spirit. And I've talked to her, and certainly will be asking a series of questions um, from our chair to the New York City Housing Authority. And with that, as I close, I just want to again. Uh, emphasize that in light of everything that is going on across the country and certainly here in the state and right here in the city of New York around the coronavirus, this city council is working very closely with the administration and all of our health care partners and stakeholders to make sure that we take every precaution possible to protect every New Yorker and their family. There's a lot of information out there, and we want to make sure that the information shared by all is number one factual and accurate. And so through a series of social media and other communications, press releases, press conferences, city council members, our speaker, the mayor, and his team are doing everything possible to share as much information as possible. Um, I think every day when we wake up, it seems more alarming. There are more confirmed cases, but as a government and as a city, we will do our best to remain calm uh, and make sure that we follow every guideline needed to follow so that we protect every New Yorker and their family. So I thank you for being here today and want to just recognize um, that we have our general manager here from the New York City Housing Authority. We have Gregory Russ, our chair of the New York City Housing Authority. We have our CFO, Anika Lescott, is here with us. We have our chief compliance officer of NYCHA, Dan Green. We have our general manager, Vito Mascatulo, as well as our executive vice president of capital projects, uh, Steve Lovici. So thank you all for being here. And with that, before you begin, we will have our committee council swear you in, and we look forward to today's hearing. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, colleagues, for being here. And I'd also like to acknowledge we have joined with us Councilmember Peter Kuhl as well. Thank you. Can you raise your right hand, please? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? You may begin. Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Gibson, members of the committee, other distinguished members of city council, residents, members of the public. Um, good afternoon. My name is Greg Russ. I'm NYCHA's chair and CEO. And as we heard in the introductions, I'm joined by the general manager. Vito Mastachulo, Vice President of our Finance Team, Anika Lescott, and Steve Lovesey, our Executive Vice President for Capital. Thank you for this opportunity to present the Authority's adopted budget, which was approved by NYCHA's board on December 18th, 2019. Before I get into the details on the budget and our recent progress, I would like to update the committee on uh, how the Authority is addressing the coronavirus in relation to residents, staff, and our properties. We are working in concert with the Health Department, NYC Emergency Management, and other city agencies to provide New Yorkers, including our residents and staff, with consistent, real-time information about the virus. We are informing residents of best practices for staying healthy and stopping the spread of germs through direct outreach in multiple languages, notifications at our developments, and digital communications uh, in a very extensive way. We created an internal task force that is planning our response to coronavirus, disseminating specific guidance to staff. For instance, we have directed staff to focus their daily cleaning on the high traffic areas, such as building entrance doors, elevator controls, 
mailboxes, and trash chutes. We've engaged a federally gov government-approved vendor to conduct deep cleanings and apply additional product protections that prevent germs from spreading. These treatments started on Wednesday at the senior-only buildings, and we're bringing in additional vendors for daily cleanings, looking to expand into the rest of the portfolio. We are also participating in the regular interagency planning meetings, updating our agency-wide continuity of operation plans, maintaining an inventory of personnel protective equipment for staff. We'll continue to keep residents, staff, and our partners, including the council members, up to date in the weeks ahead. So the groundwork for transformation moving the authority forward, NYCHA is at this time and place uh, at a moment where its future is going to be defined. In this moment, we are working with the monitor, Bart Schwartz, and his team to develop action plans in critical areas to improve resident quality of life in accordance with the HUD agreement. This is the framework for building a new NYCHA for tomorrow while benefiting our hundreds of thousands of residents today. This work of transformation involves developing an organizational plan to improve how the agency operates, and that will be released this summer. It is a collaborative effort, and we've already begun to engage our partners, including the monitor, council members, advocates, residents, staff, and other stakeholders. There is no way but transforming into a new, stronger NYCHA that delivers better services for residents, and that involves a lot of hard work. However, while the HUD agreement, including the organizational transformation, requires massive expenditures, it does not come with additional federal funding for NYCHA. We rely on the support of our city and state government partners to help us address the shortfalls, along with the programs outlined in our long-term real estate plan. NYCHA's budget is a reflection of our priorities in this time of transformation. It acknowledges that we must invest in our buildings while we achieve appropriate staffing levels. As, you, as you've heard, central office staffing has been reduced in recent years, largely through attrition. To better serve residents, we are moving resources from central office to the front line, consolidating our central offices in the process. We are hiring 632 new staff to work at our developments and on our compliance efforts, increasing last year's total budget headcount from 10,707 to 11,339 this year. At the same time, we're planning major capital improvements across the portfolio. Our total headcount has gone down by 2,100 staff in the past 16 years. And it, were impact, it has impacted NYCHA's ability to provide residents the level of service they deserve. We estimate it would cost uh, about $220 million annually to restore those 2,100 employees. But when we rehabilitate our buildings through programs like PACT, we reduce the maintenance needs and we can make more efficient use of the staff that we do have. In addition to moving resources to the developments and investing in our buildings, our focus is on managing at the property level and managing better to improve residents' quality of life and to make good use of our limited funds. Our budget outlook. We'd like to thank our congressional delegation for advocating on behalf of public housing, for their role in securing a uh, billion dollars in federal operating funding, 552 million in capital funding for 2019. This money has allowed us to carry out our work that's vital for our residents and for the future of public housing in New York City. Thanks to their advocacy, we received more capital and operating funds than we expected when we adopted the budget last year. We applied some of this money towards the operating expenses required by the agreement, investments that will benefit residents today and tomorrow. We must continue fighting for the funding for our buildings and our residents. The President has again proposed significant funding cuts for public housing authorities nationwide in his 2021 budget. Our operating budget is $3.84 billion in revenue and $3.75 billion in operating expenses as projected. We anticipate a modest 91 million surplus in 2020, which will help us mitigate deficits in the out years beginning in 2022. NYCHA receives two thirds of its operating revenues from federal sources. This year, we expect to receive 984 million in federal operating subsidy, which amounts to approximately $6,000 per apartment annually. The 2020 budget assumes 
what's called a proration factor at 95% of the operating subsidy, about a $50 million less than what NYCHA is eligible for. We also expect to receive $262 million in city operating funds, and we thank you and the mayor for these. We expect to collect about a billion dollars in rent from our residents, which is a bit more than the operating subsidy we receive from the federal government. We expect to receive $1.3 billion for Section 8 vouchers and the associated administrative fees this year. Our Section 8 program is well managed, despite the fact that we are underfunded by HUD's formula. NYCHA currently receives 99.5% of our previous year expenses and a Section 8 administrative fee that is prorated to 79%. This funding supports about 84% of the 120,000 vouchers that NYCHA is eligible for. The $3.75 billion in operating expenses includes $1.1 billion in Section 8 payments to landlords, $1.4 billion in salaries and fringe benefits, $377 million in contracts, $269 million in OTPS, supplies, vehicles, and equipment, for example. As you're aware, a significant portion of our expenses are uncontrollable, such as utilities and employee benefits. Our capital budget comprises federal funding from HUD, FEMA funding for Sandy recovery and resiliency efforts, city funding, and state funding. We received an initial allocation of $582 million in federal capital funds this year. Our 2020 budget allocates capital funding for building envelopes, building systems, including heating plant and elevator replacements, and interior renovations. Over the next five years, we plan to replace 310 boilers and 281 elevators. Since 2018, we've replaced 77 boilers. While the federal capital funding we receive is far from enough to meet the tens of billions of dollars worth of capital needs across the portfolio, and has actually declined by about $1.2 billion since 2001, we are using the money we do receive wisely and efficiently. We expend roughly $67 million per month on capital projects, and more than a billion dollars of construction work is currently underway across the authority. Last year, we obligated the prior year's capital funding in 15 months ahead of HUD's 24-month obligation deadline, and we expended the last three capital grants within an average of 17 months ahead of HUD's 48-month expenditure deadline. To facilitate the investment of city capital dollars, we're going to create some new positions devoted to the management of these projects, and we'll have more on that later in our testimony. As of the end of 2019, we awarded $2.98 billion in Sandy recovery projects, almost 92% of our FEMA money, and have completed $1.74 billion worth of work, providing residents with new roofs, electrical systems, boilers, backup power, and flood protection. This resulted in the hiring of 440 NYCHA residents as part of this process. In 2020, over $700 million is scheduled to be spent on these efforts. HUD's Energy Performance Contracting Program is enabling us to replace boilers and modernize heating systems with assistance from energy service companies without spending capital dollars up front. The improvements are funded by the cost savings from our reduced energy consumption. Four EPCs are currently investing over $271 million at 70 developments, and we are on track to exceed our total investment goal of $300 million by the end of the year, several years ahead of schedule. Mayor de Blasio has committed an unprecedented level of resources to the authority, all in a total of $6.4 billion, including $1.3 billion to repair nearly 1,000 roofs, $200 million to replace boilers and upgraded heating systems. To date, we have replaced 177 roofs, benefiting more than 28,000 residents and helping to prevent leaks that can cause mold. I would like, again, to thank our elected official partners at all levels of government for advocating for increased funding for the public housing's urgent capital needs. The HUD agreement. The HUD agreement, the monitorship, whatever term you want to apply, is our roadmap for progress for improving the delivery of services to our residents. It requires firm deadlines and goals, both immediate and several years out. 
which, as I mentioned, involves significant expenditure, expenditures for which there is no dedicated or additional federal funding. To date, we have spent approximately $200 million uh, on staff and $93 million on vendors to fulfill our obligations under the agreement. For instance, we have spent $14 million hiring 153 staff for our Healthy Homes Department, which manages efforts on lead, mold, and pests. We created three new departments that are essential to carrying out the agreement's action plans. Compliance, environmental health and safety, and quality assurance, budgeting $18 million to hire 96 additional staff for this critical work. And we anticipate substantial expenses over the next several years to address all the major areas of the agreement. We expect that it will cost over $2.2 billion to fully abate lead-based paint across the NYCHA portfolio. We are currently spending about $101 million to complete XRF tests in over 134,000 apartments. We estimate that it would cost roughly $230 million annually to achieve compliance with interim controls in the area of lead and lead remediation. The City is providing NYCHA with at least $2.2 billion in capital funding over the next 10 years. This is part of the HUD agreement. We are discussing with the Monitor our plans to use these funds to address lead, mold, heating, elevators, and pests through comprehensive modernizations as well as component replacement. We're working on a plan for use of $100 million in fiscal year 2020 state capital funds also to address the areas outlined in the agreement. We will update Council once that plan has been approved by the State. In November, the Monitor approved our plan to invest $450 million in State funding to replace 108 boilers at 25 developments and 148 elevators at 10 developments, benefiting more than 79,000 residents and reducing maintenance demands at those buildings. As we discussed in January, the Monitor approved our heating action plan and through operational improvements, we've increased staffing and made strategic investments and further reduced the time it takes to restore heat outages by 22 percent, from nine hours last season to seven hours this season. We've brought down the number of heat outages by 23 percent, from 935 last season to 720 so far this season. In addition, the number of residents impact, impacted has dropped by 21 percent. On January 30th, the Monitor approved our action plan to improve elevator service for residents. The plan outlines how we will replace 281 elevators by 2024, reduce the frequency and duration of elevator outages, and improve our communication and outreach to residents, especially senior, seniors and people with mobility uh, disabilities in the event there is an outage. We are in the process of submitting our lead action plan to the Monitor for review. We created a lead compliance assurance program to oversee lead projects and records and have trained over 3,000 staff to become EPA certified renovators. As of March 9, 2020, we continue to conduct our XRF tests in approximately 38,615 apartments to date. Of those, 17,500 apartments had positive results, 14,754 were negative, and the remainder of the results are forth forthcoming. Based on initial results, many of these units that tested positive had only one or two apartment components where lead is present, such as baseboards or windowsills or walls. The Monitor approved our mold action plan just this Wednesday. We finished rolling out our Mold Busters program citywide in September and have provided all applicable staff with hands-on training on the updated mold inspections and remediation protocols, including the new tools we're using to effectively and efficiently combat mold. To tackle pests and wastes, we've adopted an integrated pest management approach, authority-wide, training 800 staff on these protocols. To date, We've provided targeted relief to more than 3,500 apartments with recurring pest complaints and have completed more than 1,200 inspections across the city as part of our work to identify infestation hotspots. We are establishing a new waste management department, installing new trash compactors, 
and other waste disposal infrastructure and are working with the Sanitation Department to improve bulk waste pickup. The Monarch approved our action plan for ensuring the integrity of HUD inspections, known as FAS inspections, in October. We've trained more than 900 staff on FAS and HUD's uniform physical condition standards, making staff aware of the consistent daily maintenance that is needed to improve the conditions of our properties year-round. We are now validating FAS work orders through our compliance department and these efforts also involve our other newly created departments, quality assurance and environmental health and safety. The Permanent Affordability Commitment Together Pact, the majority of NYCHA's buildings are over half a century old and their massive capital needs and tens of billions of dollars in rising is the single greatest issue impacting the Authority's future. Addressing this is an absolute imperative, but it can't be done with business as usual. Through our Pact Preservation Initiative, a key and innovative part of NYCHA 2.0, we are bringing substantial reno renovations and repairs to at least 62,000 apartments by 2028, significantly improving the quality of life for residents. We are on track to achieve this goal. By this spring, nearly 21,000 apartments will be somewhere in the conversion pipeline. To date, we have converted nearly 7,800 apartments across 30 developments to more stable Section 8 funding stream through PACT, addressing 1.1 billion in hard costs for the capital needs of these properties. Last month, we closed our seventh PACT transaction, which will bring more than 370 million in major repairs and renovations to 2,625 apartments throughout Brooklyn, home to over 6,300 New Yorkers. Last month, we also selected five development teams that will work with us to preserve over 5,900 apartments in Brooklyn and Manhattan, benefiting more than 11,000 residents. We will soon release a request for expression of interest to convert and renovate an additional 5,400 apartments. We are using every tool and resource at our disposal to improve the quality of life for our residents. A key focus of our work and catalyst for change is fulfilling the obligations of the HUD agreement in collaboration with the Monitor. As noted, the federal government is not providing additional funding to meet these substantial obligations, and so we must continue advocating for the funding that public housing residents deserve. Our partnerships with stakeholders, including the council members, is vital to accomplishing all that we must accomplish, and we thank you for your support. At this critical moment, as we strive to invest in the authority and ensure that it can serve New Yorkers for another 85 years, we look forward to keeping you updated on our progress. Thank you. We are happy to answer questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Russ, and thank you to you and your team for being here. Um, we have a lot of work to do. We've done a lot of work together. And I think, you know, this city council under this administration has worked very closely with housing as it relates to making sure that there is funding from the city. Uh, we've worked with our partners in Albany to get initially $100 million that was allocated to NYCHA through the Manhattan District Attorney, and recently in 2019, another $100 million, as well as the $450 million that the governor recently signed off on. So there's been a lot of money flowing. Um, this city council continues to be very concerned, as we should, about the federal dollars and the federal impact. And this budget that the president has proposed now, um, it looks like there will be a potential 15% cut um, in federal funding based on the projections that we've seen. Um, about 60% of your operating budget for 2020 is supported by federal dollars. Um, but because there is uncertainty at the federal level, um, we at the council want to understand what the impact would be um, while the budget process is underway. Are we having conversations with our partners at HUD? Um, and are we developing some sort of a plan in the event that that cut does go through? Um, so could you get us, give us an understanding of what's happening, your conversations, and how we move forward at the federal level? Sure, thank you very much uh, for asking. This is really 
just an incredibly important issue. So um, we have been advocating uh, each budget year on our own and with other housing authorities around the country for uh, realistic budgets from the administration. And to date, we have not received any. And uh, we have been very fortunate that these budgets have uh, been delivered to Congress and our delegation uh, with support uh, from us here at home and the House has been able to craft budgets that have blunted uh, most of the uh, uh, cuts that the, the President's budget proposes. Mm -hmm. Let me start with capital uh, if you're asking about impact. Mm -hmm. um, we do not believe that the final budget that the government adopts will zero out the capital program. But in fact, that's what was proposed. That's $582 million this year, which would completely um, spin us in the wrong direction in terms of the investment that we have to make. We have uh, a, a significant amount of capital money in the pipeline, and we are actively working to obligate and expend those funds. But the kinds of cuts that the President proposed would be draconian, not only for us in New York City, but for virtually all the other housing authorities that rely on that capital budget. We have also um, uh, advocated and begun to look at uh, impacts in our operating budgets. We believe that uh, these decreases uh, are also significant. They touch our ability to do day-to-day -day maintenance, but we also believe that um, we have uh, some reserves and additional funds that in the event these cuts even came close to being implemented, we would be able to operate at some period of time uh, and transition if we had to, uh, if these became cuts that we had to actually deal with. My own view is that we're going to get a different budget out of the Congress than what the President has submitted just like we have in the past two okay. rounds of budget years. Um, but I won't, um, these are significant cuts again that the President's and the administration have proposed, and they're unconscionable. I mean, our national need in public housing is around $70 billion in capital backlog. New York is approximately half of that number, a little bit more. To propose in this time period uh, complete zeroing out is just irresponsible. Um, I wanted to ask um, uh, my CFO if she had any additional comments on the President's budget. Okay, or, before you do, can you just yes. give me the amount on operating? You said 582 million in capital. What is the potential uh, cut on operating dollars? Uh, the potential go ahead. difference would be 10% cut to NYCHA day-to-day -day operations. And how much is that? In dollar terms? Right. It would be about 50, we'll get back to you. Okay, but it would be 10% of your overall operating budget? Correct. Okay. Okay, did you want to add anything else? I was CFO. Um, I just wanted to clarify, it would be 500 Can you million, uh, put the mic closer to you? $582 million lost in capital funds, a 10% loss in the federal operating funding. So 10% of the $1 billion that we're okay, expecting. Okay, I understand. Not the total budget. Right. Um, in addition, the Section 8 program has a $5 billion national decrease. And so for NYCHA specifically, it could be approximately 6,300 vouchers lost. Okay. Wow. That's a lot. I wanted to ask specifically about the state capital funds to NYCHA. Um, I know we've worked closely with Albany to try to not only get the money in the adopted budgets, but make sure that the money is actually given to us so we could draw down on it. Um, the 2016 state enacted budget, the state provided the first major capital investment to NYCHA. Uh, about $100 million, which funded a lot of smaller capital projects, security upgrades and enhancements, as well as improvements to grounds. 
Um, these funds require that NYCHA work with DASNY, the dormitory authority, to develop a spending plan which will be subject to approval by DHCR. Um, to date, I wanted to understand where are we on those security enhancement projects um, as well as some of the other installation projects. How much have we spent of that $100 million to date and what remains outstanding from this initial allocation from 2016? Thank you very much for the question. We are in the process of spending that money. I'm going to ask um, our EVP for capital, Steve, to give you the details on where we are with the $100 million that went through the DASNY process. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you for that question. Um, I just want one clarification. The, that $100 million was managed and constructed by DASNY, by DASNY uh, right. NYCHA Capital Projects Division, or operations did not um, manage any of those funds that came in. Right, so DASNY did the work. Uh, and managed it. And managed it, okay. Yep. The funds never came through NYCHA. Okay. Um, they've completed about 139 projects of the 217 originally planned projects. Um, 17 of those are in progress. Uh, nine of those have not started. There's 52 projects that they are reallocating or have been canceled. Um, and those were broken into three distinct uh, items. Those were the security projects, the appliances, uh, which were the refrigerators and gas ranges, and then those quality life projects, which were the community centers, landscaping, and playgrounds. Security cameras, what about key fob and intercom system? Was that included? Yeah, those were part of the security projects, which were CCTV, the layered access control, as you just mentioned, some control doors, as well as lighting improvements. About okay. 78 of those projects are completed. Um, the other 20 have been canceled or reallocated by DASNY and the state legislators. Okay, appliances for new tenants or existing tenants? Do we know? Um, I believe it was a mix. Mixture. I'm and the last category you described, you said quality of life. That includes community centers, playground, exterior, like recreation at some of the developments? Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, and the reason I ask is because in the past, some of my colleagues have developments where NYCHA has done capital work versus the DASNY capital work, and there is a difference in the quality of work that's being done. So this allocation, as you mentioned, was done solely by DASNY. What role did NYCHA have in this? Did we uh, make recommendations? Uh, did we oversee? What was the role we played in working with DASNY and DHCR? Mm -hmm. So um, we worked with DASNY a lot on the lessons learned that we had, um, also uh, engagement with the residents, engagement with the development staff, we were brought up to speed on their schedules in terms of when they were going to start construction, and we gave them lessons learned on uh, working with the city on construction projects within the city. Okay. And how many projects are remaining outstanding? You said 17 are in progress, 52 were repurposed, reallocated, and what's remaining uh, to about, complete? So of, the, of, of those 217, the 139 have been completed, so you've got 17 projects that are in progress, nine roughly that have not started yet, and okay. 52 uh, that are being repurposed or canceled. Okay, got it. And since I'm on the state, um, I also want to talk about the 2018 enacted budget included $200 million for capital work at NYCHA and the following year, 2019, we had an additional $250 million for critical repairs. Um, however, I think we all understand that that total, $450 million, was not made available to NYCHA until a few months ago. Um, the agreement between NYCHA and DASNY on a grant disbursement agreement in connection with this $450 million has been completed. So I wanted to understand the $450 million, we council members were notified of which developments included any of this capital work, specifically boiler, 
replacements and elevator replacements. So I wanted to understand where we are on timing, how many projects have we started, um, and what remains left to be done. Very and I know this is recent. I'm very clear. We thank just you. got this $450 million. I'm very clear on no, that. No, thank you very much. Go ahead, Steve. We, know. And we can, we can um, run down your you, list. You know that I'm very passionate about Capital Projects Division. So as, as is I. I. I am too. Thank you very much for asking that question. Um, the 450 is a reimbursement program, and you're absolutely correct. We've now, uh, the monitor has agreed the GDA action plan, um, which allows us to move forward with those funds. We are doing two different things. In the elevator pipeline, we are currently in design on those elevators. This is okay. going to be a design bid build program, and uh, we're in the design st stage at this point in time. We are on schedule for those elevator programs. The, the heating plant program is actually part of uh, what the state allowed us to do, which is design build. We are in the first stage, we will be in the second stage very soon, um, basically within the, within the month, on a design build program for the heating pipeline that's associated to the phase one of those heating, pipe, uh, heating plants. Okay. So for the $450 million, we do have design build authority approved by the state, and who made the determination on which developments would receive the boiler and elevator replacements? So those were part of the original allocations with the state legislators, and then those are all uh, online and published in the GDA action plan. Okay, got it, okay. And we have the list of developments um, and that's been made available to the council members. Um, I have one question before I turn it over to my colleagues and then I'll circle back. Um, Chair, you alluded in your opening the difference between spending federal capital dollars versus city capital dollars. Um, I got excited when you talked about bringing on a member of the team to focus solely on spending city capital dollars. And I bring that up because the city capital commitment rate for NYCHA has been hovering around 25% for quite a few years. Um, it's actually about 30% over the past five years. Um, in 2019, NYCHA committed about 25% of the $1.2 billion that was allocated in the city's 2019 executive commitment plan. Um, in fiscal 2019, the average citywide commitment rate across city agencies is 70%. Um, so can you explain again why NYCHA does not spend city capital dollars and what are our plans to draw down on city dollars faster in a more expeditious way? And who is this new staff person that we're bringing on? And what will their role and responsibility be? So uh, Steve and I have talked quite a bit about this because um, we really feel that we need to make an organizational change as part of uh, yes. the answer to, to your question. Um, and there's two things that will happen organizationally. Uh, one is that um, Steve is establishing a position in his department, and that person would be a liaison on the city council uh, projects that we have uh, currently and in future. The other thing we've agreed to do uh, is create a small projects team. So there would be additional support inside of capital for making sure that these funds are um, expended more timely and uh, with better scheduling and focus. One reason that you see some of the numbers uh, that, you, that you've quoted is that um, the federal government has a process where they will give you a budget uh, in a particular year, give you that money, and they have a, a firm uh, process where they give you 24 months to obligate those funds. And when they use the term obligate, they mean 24 months to design, consider uh, procurement, and sign a contract. Then they give you another 24 months to expend uh, under the contract and complete the hard cost work. And that's a very different process on the federal side than what we go through on the city. 
And I wanted to ask Steve if he could explain a little bit how the city process is different from that and um, uh, why that uh, often shows us um, in, as we do the design part of this with the kind of balances that you're referencing. Okay, well I will also say, and I understand, the federal government gives you a timeline to obligate funds. If the city does not, but that does not mean that we have to allow capital projects to languish and no. not get started. Oh no, I'm not suggesting. I don't want to yeah. suggest that the city starts to put a time frame on spending city dollars, mm -hmm. but something has to be done in the past few fiscal years from 2015 to 2019, NYCHA has been under that 30% capital commitment rate, whereas most agencies are closer to 70. So I need to understand what we're doing to improve our commitment rate, but without a time frame, that should not be a reason why city dollars are not spent in a timely fashion. That's not acceptable. No, not I, for I, council members that give money to NYCHA every year, and we expect our projects to move forward. I no, just want to make that clear. No, I understand, and we have the same expectation, which is why we're making the changes that I mentioned earlier, because we definitely feel that uh, we'd like to line up more closely to the expectation you have for that spending. So uh, I only call that out because it's a contrast in how the funds are uh, looked at from uh, city versus federal. But that does not mean we're in any way less committed to getting to the place that you just described, which is more timely and quicker expenditures. And um, that's one of the reasons we're going to do the small projects team. We want folks who are devoted to managing these and getting these out the door. But I, I did want Steve to add uh, one thing that related to the design period. Like any project we deal with, even the, the smaller ones uh, that we might have, uh, often through the generosity of a city council member, uh, we're obligated to do the design, we're obligated to do the planning, there's also uh, likely a resident engagement piece. We're obligated to go to bid, and we're obligated to secure bids that we feel are responsible and reasonable, and then we're obligated to do the, the actual construction work. So in that process, though, um, I wanted Steve to kind of just point out how we differ a little bit in terms of what we're spending, how the rates show up. Please. Thank you very much, Greg. So um, what Greg is explaining in terms of the federal versus the city is the concept of how a project gets constructed. Let's say, for example, I have a $500,000 project. In the federal pipeline, I know that the first year is going to be design. So only 10% of the dollars associated to that $500,000 project are going to be allocated that first year. And then when we get into the second year, we go into construction. And so maybe $250,000 as we put some more funds up front to get the construction started, and then the remainder of that following year as you close out that project, $200,000. The difference, what Greg was mentioning, is in the city program, particularly for NYCHA, and maybe not some of the other agencies, is that the entire $500,000 comes into our, our account right up front. So what, you, what the numbers say is, three years of funding is in that single year. So it would actually be not prudent for us to have a higher percentage because that would mean that we spent out three years of funding in one year. We really should be only funding 10% of that that first year. We're actually working with OMB and they, we have approved this. We're right-sizing our portfolio to match how construction happens and how it works with other agencies. So what we will do is we've shown them our entire portfolio, all of the schedules, and the first year funding, you're only gonna see about 10%, which would have been those design fees. And then the following year, you're gonna see the construction fees flow into that. It helps the city in terms of right size management, but it will also illustrate that the numbers are better. Um, we were informed that potentially our numbers are, are, are better than all of the other agencies, or at least comparable to the other agencies, if we were to right size those funds. Um, I do want to just give you one more piece is that we have a lot of great wins uh, with the city. Most of the projects that we're doing, the major initiatives that we're doing um, are ahead of schedule. Um, and not only have they been ahead of schedule, 
we've been working with OMB that they've actually given us more money so we could move them forward. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, the mayor's roofing uh, initiative. That was originally 10 years. It was about 100 million each year. We've been, we've been doing so well on that program that we've actually moved up to about 200 million each year and we've moved it down to eight years. So we're saving a number of years in the process because of the roofing program that's going up. The mayor's heating initiative, we cut back on some procurement time. We, we looked at every single day that we could cut out of a schedule, every single day that we could cut out of a, a design time where we went from 12 months from design to nine months to design. And we're actually on schedule for all of the heating plants that were part of the mayor's heating initiative that was a, about uh, nine contracts, 11 developments. So in terms of our spend, we're actually spending and succeeding really well on those major programs. And I think by right-sizing our portfolio, you're gonna see the percentages coming out of the, the, the reports that capital at the New York City Housing Authority is, is actually comparable to all the other agencies or better. Okay, I thank you for clarifying. I guess I only wish that we started this process much earlier in terms of working yes. with OMB on right sizing. Many of us have been here for seven and 10 years and we're still talking about how we can draw down faster on city dollars. So that it would have made sense, but I understand we're here to do work yeah. and we need to make sure that whoever this person is that starts, I'm assuming they're going to be starting sometime soon. Yes. Okay, and then also the other part of this conversation, even with design build, we need to work with OMB on vacancies that we identify in the capital division. Designers and architects, and if there is a vacancy, we need assistance with HP, I'm sorry, with OMB to make sure that we can do better recruitment and bring on staff. The challenges that we sometimes understand with many of our agencies is we don't have sufficient staff in the capital division. So if there are vacancies, we need to fill them. With all of this capital work that's happening, federal and city dollars, we don't want vacancies in the capital unit, even bringing on a new staffer. So I would expect that to be prioritized and you all working with OMB um, through this budget process. Council member, we, uh, we wholeheartedly agree. We, we really want to, um, there's a number, there'd be a number of other things that we'll be bringing to council in the near term, including better information on the overall capital spend from all sources. Uh, the small projects team that we mentioned is about managing those smaller uh, capital programs and uh, we believe that uh, working with OMB on how we count the funding and then working our own uh, with our own crew to get the funding out the door we are going to make a turn and can show a change so um, uh, these things will be coming into place in the near term and as we get this formed up we will let council know uh, when we we've shifted to the new form of operation Okay, I appreciate that. I'm going to get to my colleagues that have questions as well. I want to acknowledge the presence of Councilmember Mark Joni and Councilmember Bill Perkins, and we will begin Councilmember questions uh, with our first colleague that was here first, uh, Councilmember Ruben Diaz Sr. for questions, followed by Councilmember Carlina Rivera. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Good morning, ladies. I Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Greg Ross. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know if you know that there's an organization in the U.S. state called NIPERC, New York Public Interest Research Group. They have had a great success all across the state in reducing Fuel, co fuel costs through group buying. In your statement, you said that your utility costs are uncontrollable. My question, have you ever met with NIPERC to enroll in their fuel buying group? Um, I'm not aware that we have, but we'd certainly be willing to. And I just want to be clear that that term on the uncontrolled cost refers to certain fixed costs in the budget like salaries and benefits that we have to pay uh, every year. 
So we'd be glad to get the information for the group, and I'd be happy to sit with them and see if they can offer us uh, some opportunities. Uh, uh, could you, could you, so you having enrolled or, or approached NIPER to help you reduce fuel costs? Well, we, we have not as yet. I mean, we, we'd be willing to do So I it. suggest that you should do no, something like that. Fine. because if we are we're always we're always looking to do that. Yes. Okay, so please do that because they, they, they are good helping. Sure. And, and I would say we are uh, working with other groups on our utilities. The energy performance contracts that I mentioned in the testimony, that's a way to reduce utility costs. We have some additional ideas that we're going to be running out this year, and uh, we're very interested and would be glad to talk with them about their ideas on how we might make an impact. Can you, can you tell me how many senior centers are located in NYCHA building? I'm going to ask if um, the general manager can respond to that question. Senior centers. So, sir, I um, don't have the exact number of centers, um, and we will get that in a few minutes. What was that again? I said we will look for the number of senior centers. You don't centers. know. You don't know how many senior centers are located no, in Sorry, I said building. just give us a minute, and we're looking up that information now. But you should, you should, that's something you should know by a, a skin so we have 90, Sir, we have 97 senior centers located at NYCHA properties. I just want to know how many senior centers. 97, are, sir. Okay. So are you implementing any specific measure to protect those seniors attending centers in NYCHA? Or are you just leaving that to other city agencies? So, sir, if you're speaking specifically about the current issue that we're dealing with? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about if you have implemented so we have a very any close specific measure to protect seniors that are located in Nacha Bini or are you leaving that to other city agencies to deal with? No, sir. We, we have a very close working relationship with our city partners, um, primarily with the Department for the Aging. Um, we also have a close relationship with a number of providers and not-for-profit groups. So there's a joint effort in dealing with our seniors um, and their safety and well-being. So, so you're taking care of, of the senior in, in NYCHA building? You are taking care of seniors? We are doing there. our absolute best to address all of the issues and concerns that our seniors are raising, yes. Because I, I, I have not heard you or any even the mayor saying, for specific for senior centers in located in Nacha building, we're doing this, this, and that. I haven't heard that. Well, sir, I believe that, that we did address that in the chair's testimony, that we did call out some of the efforts at our senior developments. Um, right. with, with, with respect to the current. I'll tell you what I heard. Maybe, I, okay. maybe it's not. True, but this is what I heard that you are telling staff and coding hours to protect staff from from the coronavirus. That you are coding staff. No, and sir, that is not coding not hours. Not correct. No, in fact, it's just the opposite. So, are you implementing staff to help uh, um, decontaminate seniors, the senior center located in Nacha? So, sir, we have, um, and the chair mentioned in his testimony, <coughs> so we have 71 buildings where seniors reside. These are senior buildings only. Right? And we have started an, in, an intensive cleaning program. We started this week. By so the end many, of today. So how many centers? Sir, okay, now listen what I'm talking about. I'm not right doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating myself in NYCHA, in senior center located in NYCHA. How many senior centers located in NYCHA as of today you have a specific same a group to the, to the 
decontaminate and clean that, those centers. So, so sir, I, I want to just kind of differentiate. We have 97 senior centers in our buildings, right? The efforts to provide additional cleaning services at those centers are being provided through the Department for the Aging and efforts undertaken by the city. We have 71 buildings, residential buildings, that are senior buildings only, where we have started an intensive cleaning program, where we have brought in outside contractors to so, supplement so our know, staff. So you don't know how many centers, specific centers, you have already cleaned? But those centers are being cleaned by that another. decontaminated. I mean, like yes. you're doing with school, you're doing with somewhere, you're doing with within. How many centers already? Oh, we sent a crew there to decontaminate. How many? So all the centers and buildings are being cleaned daily. So the, no, the answer is no. The answer is that DIFTA and the providers in the building are taking on the cleaning that you're you're discussing. They they are they are working in the senior centers to do exactly what you described. They are working on yes. citizens. Could you tell me where, which ones? I, I do not have that information, but I'd be glad to check with DIFTA and get back to you and give it to you. It'll be, it'll be all of them that they have a presence in, but. All 97. Yeah, so we could give you, we can check with DIFTA and get that information. So, so no, no, none of us elected officials, city council member could go to our district and tell our senior uh, centers, uh, we, the city, are taking care of this center and this center, uh, and the senior that come to this center have been protested. So we, none of us could do, could do that because you don't know how many centers have you cleaned up. No, I, I, I would, I would say that we have another agency that's working in the center to do the kind of things that you're so discussing. That's what I asked before. You are leaving that to other city agencies. So now you're leaving that and to other city agencies. If, if you would like us to get the information on how that cleaning is being conducted and the progress they've made, we'd be glad to provide that to you. All right. Changing the subject to another question. I, how are you addressing the underfunded hot for formula used currently? Has has the law department been helpful with legal uh, pressure on the equal protection? I'm sorry, could you? Could I'm going to repeat my. How yeah, are you addressing addressing the underfunded hot formula used currently? Is the law department helping you or not? In, in what you're describing, the undercut, the undercut formula, I mean, the, formu the formula that HART is using yeah. is, is, under, is, being, is underfunded. No, that's true. But what I wanted to respond to was uh, your question about the law department. The way that the federal government uh, provides the funds to us is there is a formula, for example, on how to calculate the total eligibility for operating subsidy for any housing authority, including NYCHA. Typically, what's happened is either the administration or Congress proposes a number that is a percentage of that formula. And in uh, past years, it's been higher than we could have expected, around 97, 98 um, percent of, of that. In other years, it's been, we've had uh, some significant drops, but we're not able to act legally through that because Congress is appropriating what they think they can afford to appropriate. Um, it's not a question of us being able to go back to HUD and say, um, we want you to change the formula or fund the full amount. Congress has that discretion to fund that formula at whatever level they feel they need to fund it at. It, it's not something we could uh, attack or sue on. But, but there's something called equal protection. Yes, sir, there is. And, um, but in terms of appropriations at the federal level, they really, do, uh, they really do have the final say on how much money they can put into the program. All right, last question. We all know about the lead, the lead uh, portioning the lead problem that we're having. Uh, what, what independent resource, resource you use 
to watch the lead compliance unit. Yeah, I mean, you have you have a unit to 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 do the, the with the lead compliance, and now who's watching that unit? So uh, I'm going to start and then ask the general manager if he wants to add anything. So in terms of the work that follows, uh, so that we're either remediating or abating lead in the unit, that work can be checked by our compliance department. Uh, it can also be checked by the environmental health and safety, and if we wanted to, quality assurance as well. Those three departments that I mentioned in the testimony create something that NYCH has not had before, and that is the ability to go out, validate that work has been done, that it's been done properly, and that any kind of work ticket associated with that has been appropriately closed. Um, so those departments are checking on that kind of work, and I don't know, Vito, you wanted to add anything? Sure, sir, if I could just add one other piece um, to the oversight. So currently we have 15 contracts for XRF testing, but we also have two additional contracts just for QA. So these are vendors that do not have contracts um, with us for the testing. And they're going out there and doing quality assurance testing as well. So, so you, you're not trusting what they're telling you. You are verifying what they tell, uh, what they telling you, because um, they have a unit. They submit a report. You, you are not trusting that. You have somebody has to check that report. We have multiple ways of, of I'm glad to hear quality that. controls. Yes. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Thank you, Manager. Thank you. Thank you, council member. And just expanding a little bit on what the council member was talking about as it relates to the 97 senior centers that are in NYCHA developments but are managed by DIFTA and contracted out to local community-based organizations. While NYCHA no longer manages these centers, it's really incumbent upon you to make sure that the senior centers are protected. So I know you, Chair, you, you expressed the interagency coordination with OEM and the mayor's office, mm -hmm. but what are we specifically doing with the Department for the Aging to ensure that the CBOs on the ground have the supplies, the equipment, the materials, the staffing that they need to completely clean, fumigate, and make sure that senior centers are clean? Is there anything mm -hmm doing differently and then I would also say the same question goes for DYCD our community centers in NYCHA are also contracted out to local CBOs so are we having those conversations what does that look like and even though NYCHA no longer manages this is your property and so we expect to make sure that there remains a level of oversight so can you clarify that so we all understand what exactly is being done Sure, so if I can, with um, respect to the senior centers, um, so we are well, part of a multi-agency task force, um, and the other agencies that are on the task force um, include the um, Department for the Aging as well as Department of Health. Right? We do daily calls with them, right? and there have been a number of initiatives um, that, so there we, um, the PEU, uh, which is the unit that goes out and do the door knocks, um, have been canvassing all the centers. Um, they're mobilizing plans um, to serve senior citizens, to increase Meals on Wheels if it's ne necessary. Um, so there is a daily check-in that we are um, part of um, and very focused on senior centers. We've also done very specific um, outreach to seniors in four different languages. In fact, we just pushed out another robocall today um, that is, again, just reminding seniors um, about how they can properly protect themselves um, against um, exposure to the germs. So those are just some of, I mean, we can kind of outline for you in more detail the efforts that are being made and focused on seniors. Okay, out of the agencies you described between NYCHA, DIFTA, and DOHMH, do you know yourself, are any of the agencies physically going to visit centers? Robocalls I appreciate, phone calls I appreciate, emails I appreciate, but we also appreciate on the ground visits. Are we going physically into these centers? Yes, yes, there are staff okay. that are canvassing each of the centers. Okay, okay, now what about DYCD? I will have to get back to you on yeah. DYCD. 
Okay, and now the other question I have since we mentioned and are talking about seniors who sometimes have uh, more of a vulnerability in terms of compromising immune systems, the 71 senior buildings that may or may not have a senior center on the development, those are the standalone centers, sorry, standalone buildings that we have. What are we doing there because there really are, there's no staff, um, sometimes no super that lives in the building. What are we doing to monitor those seniors as well? Because they really are out there by themselves. They have no one to monitor them. Um, are we visiting those buildings in particular? Sure, so we have um, increased our presence at those developments. We've posted um, signage at each of the buildings, not just the senior buildings, but every building within our portfolio. And again, specific for the 71 senior buildings, we started a cleaning and protective measure initiative. Um, by the end of today, we will have addressed approximately 50 of the 71 senior buildings with the first phase, which is of a thorough cleaning of touch points. So that would include the building entrance door, mailboxes, elevator controls, um, the hopper door handles. Right, so this is a very um, aggressive effort. The second phase of this is the contractor will be coming back out to apply a solution that is a combination of a deep cleaning agent um, as well as a, a protective coating. So it's kind of like a scotch guarding of sorts, right? but this protective coating actually will kill germs before it makes contact with the surface. The recommendation was to do a reapplication every 90 days. Right? We are at the senior buildings doing a reapplication of that solution every 30 days. Okay. So we already have contracts in place right? and the initiative has already begun. This includes doors, windows, walls, Not, common areas. So again, we're focused in the lobbies. We're touching on the high traffic. Okay, well, no, I'm in the lobby. The yeah, walls so, in the lobby, the doors. You no, know, again, most people do not touch the walls. So it's the doors, it's the handles, the push plates, right? it's the elevator controls, the mailboxes, the hopper doors. Okay. Right? This is not a cleaning of every surface in the lobby. Because again, we've worked with a number of agencies, both at the, um, the city and federal level, and we've looked at mm -hmm. CDC guidances and Department of Health and Mental Hygiene guidance. Um, and we've talked to a number of people in the industry, and the recommendation is not to do a thorough cleaning of the entire lobby, but certain touch points. Who's making this recommendation? So there are, there are a group of um, agencies, including Department of Health. We've talked to experts in the industry. Okay, and when will you get to all 71? You said you're at 50 now? By the end of today, we will have completed the first phase which is a cleaning of okay. approximately 50 of the 71. Mm -hmm. The contractor is working through the weekend as well. Okay, good. Are we using any different types of solution yeah. and materials that are in terms of quality, quality materials to clean and completely desensitize? Are we using anything different than what we normally have done? Yeah, I, we the contractor that we described is using um, uh, bleach type wipe uh, on the surfaces. Uh, we have observed the contractor's crew going out to look at it. They're wiping them down uh, with that material first and um, kind of sanitizing it that way. So this is a, uh, a difference than um, some of the other products that we've been using. This is actually uh, a disinfectant-based product. Okay. And I, and I would say too that the chemical, uh, the solution that they're using, it's not a chemical, a solution that they're using for the protection of these surfaces is kind of cutting edge. Right? It's not a standard off the shelf solution. Right? So it's, uh, it's eco friendly. Um, and it's biofilm. Biofilm. And uh, um, it's, it's designed to, um, if any uh, bacteria or virus comes to rest, it's actually designed to uh, uh, inhibit or inhibit them, and it um, does it does it through a biological uh, okay. approach. Okay. So I was out at three of our centers, uh, senior buildings, on uh, Wednesday, um, watching the first phase of the cleaning. Okay, understand. Thank you. Uh, let me get to Council Member Carlina Rivera, followed by Council Member Peter Coe. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for being here, and, and thank you, Madam Chair. You know, we, I know you're, we're experiencing frustration. All of us are very, very um, anxious. And so I just want you to know that we're asking you a lot of these questions, and, and some of them are kind of the same, but it's because NYCHA historically mm. has kind of let us down. So we're asking you these questions because even in the testimony, right in the beginning, it says we created an internal task force that is planning our response, that is planning our response. It's here. So we just want to make sure that whatever it is that you need, that we are able to advocate for you because with seniors at such a high risk and, and no supplies seemingly to be found anywhere, we want to make sure your connection with the mayor and the governor potentially could at least give you the supplies that you need. But those aren't my questions. Those are not my questions. It, 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 is, it is just very frustrating and we want to make sure that as we look at public systems, I always say that you know, a part of our public systems and, and general infrastructure, NYCHA should always be considered. So the same care and attention and funding that we give to our hospitals and our transit, people don't talk about public housing in the same way. And so, I mean, I, I, I think we should fully fund public housing, um, but that's my personal stance. So let me ask you a couple questions about the actual budget. So you mentioned that two-thirds of NYCHA's operating budget is from the federal government, and the city contributes $262 million per year. But what's the state's contribution to NYCHA's expense budget? So uh, right now, I believe the state's is all capital, and uh, there, there isn't an operating uh, baseline coming uh, from all the state money has been capital. You have $32 billion in capital needs, and the number's expected to double within 10 years. And while I think that all levels of government, state, federal, and city, should be contributing, we know that operational funding for ongoing maintenance and repairs is essential mm -hmm. for avoiding large, large capital backlogs like the one we're experiencing right now. So do you have an estimate for repairs and maintenance needs this year, and how much expense funding would be needed to cover this? So I would uh, think, uh, now you're making me think about, so I would differentiate inside the operating budgets, and I'll, I'll ask uh, the CFO and the GM if they want to weigh in. Inside the operating budgets, there are funds for the crews, the repairs, the day-to-day -day maintenance. At NYCHA, day-to-day -day maintenance could be something very simple, like, uh, oh, gee, we have to go uh, adjust a uh, door closer or something like that. But because of the condition of the buildings, those repairs can become extensive and complex, expect, especially the ones with the mold and the leaks. So I would say that the budgets reflect the ability to get um, uh, our crews into the properties to, to make uh, those essential repairs. But at some point, I would also say that we're, we're in the position where we need, in addition to the daily day-to-day -day expense, we are going to need a very large infusion of capital uh, across the entire portfolio. Um, when you look at the um, RAD and PACT conversions, those alone have raised $1.1 in hard costs. Those are actual repair costs. That number has to repeat many times across the portfolio. And I wanted to ask the CFO if she could give you a breakdown on where the money's going so you can get a sense of what we're spending uh, to your first point on the day-to-day -day operations. Thank you, Greg. Um, so in terms of the uses of funding, we have an expense budget that is $3.75 billion. 1.4 billion of that is for personal services. So that includes salary and expenses for the 11,339 employees at the authority. The lion's share of those employees are at the front line, so they're in the operations space. So that accounts for already 38% of our budget. In addition, we have 377 million in contracts, so that's 10%. So that's vendors to help us to supplement the work being done at the properties. That also includes some staff augmentation. So to hire temporary staff to help out in key targeted areas where we need additional support. In addition, we have 269 million, so another 7% in other services. So this accounts for supplies, equipment, and all the other materials that we need to support the front lines. 
The remaining balance is 554 million in utilities. So that's that 15% of cost that Greg alluded to before. So that accounts for heating, electricity, oil, gas, everything that our 173 some odd thousand units need to continue to run. And the remaining balance, that 1.1 billion, that's Section 8 payments to landlords. So as mentioned, we get the Section 8 funding from HUD and most of it goes out to the landlords and NYCHA keeps a small portion for the administration which is allowed by the federal government. Okay, I want to ask about just NYCHA 2.0. It sets a pretty ambitious uh, goal for raising capital funds, yet only raises enough to cover 75% of the capital needs. Do you have a real estate analysis that shows how realistic the valuation of the NYCHA 2.0 is? So um, let me start by saying that uh, in terms of the um, RAD and PAC deals that were actually on uh, target, uh, by the end of the uh, year, we hope to have over 20,000 units in the pipeline. And those closings, the ones that we just experienced and the ones that we've had uh, historically, are producing uh, significant uh, capital funds for hard costs. Um, for example, um, the Brooklyn uh, Mega Bundle uh, is going to produce uh, approximately $371 million in hard costs from, from that uh, deal. But does it change, I mean, does it change the 75-25 factor? I mean, is it financially sound to kind of offload the majority of your assets to only 75% of your needs? And do you have plans for raising the remaining 25%? So uh, at, at the property level, these projects are penciling out and are meeting the need. And if you look across all the different options that come with 2.0, uh, the numbers that you're referencing were based on the assumptions that we'd have a blend of approaches, which includes uh, RAD, which includes build to preserve and transfer to preserve. And um, we've targeted 62,000 plus units for those. We think that um, that's still a good number, but I would say to you that we are also working on developing uh, a set of capital plans for the other 110,000 units. Um, I hope in the next uh, near term, we would be able to begin to present ideas that would show a capital plan uh, goal and ambition for the entire portfolio. So that is coming uh, and would supplement and actually complement what we're doing with uh, 2.0. Okay, and just my last question, Madam Chair. This year, our office received an increase in complaints about sanitary conditions on developments and general cleanliness and maintenance concerns. And our office was told that NYCHA had cut development maintenance positions and changed the cleaning schedules, which was the cause of these complaints. NYCHA is adding 632 positions this fiscal year. How many of these positions will be directly in developments to address the understaffing problems? And I know there's the added factor of increased cleaning. Sure. Uh, uh, almost all those positions are intended to go to front line. Um, so we want to, we recognize that we are thin there. And, pardon? Properties and skilled trades, both. And I didn't know if the general manager wanted to add anything on the scheduling. Sure. So I think what you're referencing is what we refer to as AWS, the alternative work schedule, um, which is a new schedule that we rolled out um, last March uh, for caretakers. That was the first title um, that we negotiated um, contract language with. And I admit that it's been a rocky rollout. Uh, some developments have embraced the concept of AWS. Um, other developments are still struggling with the concept of it. I think we need to keep in mind that the work schedule had not changed for over 50 years. Right? This is a new concept for a majority of our staff. Right? We have trained over 450 supervisors um, with respect to AWS. We're doing time and motion studies. Then we're bringing on a consultant to help us deal with the developments that are still struggling with the concept of AWS. So I just want to Thank you. I, I know that it's maybe the first change in 50 years, but I mean, that's, it's still our obligation. So I, I may, just. I'm sorry to add. So we've really, yeah. we've gone from an 8 to 430 
five day a week work schedule to a seven day work schedule from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. And in fact, through AWS, we were able to add an additional 210 caretakers of which 70% of those were residents. So I just wanna echo um, uh, the Madam Chair's uh, comments on creating a new uh, position devoted to the management of the capital projects because I don't even know how many employees are dedicated to this now, but our concern has always been over the pipeline mm -hmm. and how much money we allocate. Mm -hmm. And like a senior building elevator, like how is that not a priority? Why does it take so long? I know she asked you all of these questions. I just wanna reiterate that sometimes I think it's not so much as creating a new position, but looking at what exists and what's not working. And then the last thing I'll say is in terms of FEMA, I have a lot of FEMA work going on on, my, on our campuses. It's kind of a mess, it's getting a little bit better, but I just hope that you'll go over the budget. I, I've asked for an audit of the FEMA work and I just wanna be responsive to and be fiscally responsible that, you know, this is 2.98 billion, there's 1.74 billion dollars of work that has already been completed according to your testimony. And I just don't know if we're gonna go over budget and what that means for the quality of life of my residents. And I know we took you on a tour uh, Mr. Chair, along with the, yes. the, the local electeds, including Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez. And, and I just really want to emphasize, just please stay on top of some of this work and make sure it's done expeditiously and on time and on budget. No, I, I appreciate your comments very much because having been there at the site with you and going to the, some of the other sites, this is an enormous construction job and comes with all the issues and disruption. Um, I know Stephen and Capital are committed to um, really stepping up to make sure we can address some of the complaints, which in some ways when we were there that day were just tangential to the work, like uh, I want the light moved or, and we wanna be more responsive to that and we're committed to doing that. So thank you. And Councilwoman, if I may, so the earlier statement or comment that you made um, with reference to the task force and our preparations, I think it's important to note that we have been at the table um, from the very beginning. Uh, so we've, uh, I have personally been in, in, in all the interagency um, meetings um, with the mayor's office and all the uh, city agencies. Um, we are constantly being asked what our needs are, um, where we are with respect to our planning, and um, the planning is developing. Um, as we receive more information and learn more about how we can better address the issues at our developments and better protect our residents and our staff, we're pushing out notifications, we're educating um, our residents and staff, we're changing our plan um, as more information comes in. Thank you, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Council Member. And just to add a little bit on, uh, the Council Member talked a lot about NYCHA 2.0, and in your testimony, you talked about the conversion of 7,800 apartments across 30 developments, um, the $1.1 $1 billion in hand, in hard course for the capital needs of the properties. You talked about closing on the seventh packed transaction. So even with all that we described, all that's in the queue, um, there's still that $8.9 billion gap. That's correct. Um, now, is there a time frame in which we should expect that there will be a plan release? Like, should we be looking to get this by the executive budget? Is this something that we will see in the immediacy, or is this more of a long-term plan to no, address it's, uh, it? it's something we hope to uh, have out in the very near term uh, okay. in the next um, uh, 30 to 60 days and begin to actually circulate the ideas uh, and and uh, uh, present them uh, to the community at large. Okay, great. So it's coming in the near term. Okay, great. Um, next we'll have Council Member Peter Kuhl followed by Council Member Diana Ayala. <coughs> thank you, uh, Chair Lady. And thank you, um, Chairman Ross and your team. Uh, I'm Council Member Peter Kuhl of Fashion uh, Council District 20. I will focus my questions on the Bland House in Foster in Queens. Last year, uh, the, the chair of the Committee on Housing, on Public Housing, MP Samuel, and I walked to Bland House to visit the management's office during the posting hours. The door was locked. After we reported this to Niger, Niger promised that they would 
ensure that the office will be open during post day hours. Uh, now I'm being told that the four developments have been combined to one management office and receiving complaints uh, from residents. The four developments are Bland House, Leverick 34th, 125-0122 Avenue, and Latimer Gardens. When did the consolidations of four developments into one management office occur? Did you know that? I'm the, the four developments, they have only one management office. Yeah, we have to. Yeah. When did it happen? Uh, so, sir, I'm sorry, but we will have to check into this information and get back to you. But this is the first that we at the table are hearing this. Oh. Um, so we do need to find because, out. Because our, our office wasn't notified. Okay. And, and sir, uh, what was this? And the residents get confused because uh, many of them are senior citizens. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's hard for them to walk like, like a, one, a mile well, to make a complaint. So first off, the offices should be open on the hours we say they should be open. And I would like to follow that up based on the feedback you're giving us right now. And secondly, um, I would commit to, uh, if, if you would like, uh, coming and uh, either meeting with you or walking the site so we can see what you see. And we can take appropriate steps to make sure that uh, we're addressing the problems that you're, you're communicating to us. So my second question is on scaffolding. The, the Bland House is currently surrounded by scaffolding, which is blocking the security cameras that I funded. Uh, the residents have been reported to me that they feel unsafe. So uh, what existing project currently requires scaffolding? And when can residents expect the scaffolding to be removed? Because it has been up there for a long time and they, they didn't see them do anything. Um, thank you for that. I'm gonna ask uh, Stephen to, to talk to you a little bit about the scaffolding. Uh, and then if the scaffolding has to stay, can NYCHA provide temporary cameras because it's blocking the original cameras that we put up there? And uh, to the camera question, yes, we would be interested in seeing those locations and making sure they're in the right spot. Uh -huh. uh, if you have some that you can, that you know or the residents have pointed out, we'd be glad to uh, work and, and see if we can get that part of it addressed. Okay. And, I'm going to ask Stephen to talk about the scaffolding at that at the location. Yeah. So my, my last question is on uh, capital projects. For fiscal year 2017, I put in funding for a security gate similar to the one at International House in Jamaica and also for grants beautifications. Five years later, I have heard nothing on the project. So I want you to find out the status. Okay. Yeah. And also... Fiscal 2020, I funded new lighting on the development on Ben House. Uh, only two out of the five buildings have seen an update on the, the new lighting. Uh, when can we expect the remaining three buildings to get updated? Okay. On Ben House, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So um, currently, the 2020 allocation funding year for the 300 thousand dollars for lighting upgrades and that is it is being it's in construction and it's in in that phase the local law 11 work that's the emergency shedding work um, at this point in time the funding year for the work the facade work associated to that is 2023 um, and that is when the the shed or the the work associated to those sheds will start mm. Because uh, the reason I want to make a complaint now is because normally I wouldn't be here because I'm not a committee member. But we have committed these, these three questions uh, to NYCHA for many months. We didn't get any answer. And finally, my staff uh, emailed to the, to the uh, respondent, to the boss of, of the place, and we still didn't get an answer. We just, she just said, we get back to you. you know? So I want you to like, improve uh, communications uh, f from council members because we, we feel the bad of the we send you an email and you never reply to us no that uh, it, that 
doesn't work for me and it doesn't work for you. Yeah. And uh, um, if you feel that you've got an issue with our response. So uh, I have to come here, the way to, to make yeah. a no, I, I, you're let, No, yeah. you're letting me know, I appreciate it. And yeah. I, I would commit to you that uh, we have a group uh, that is interested in getting your email and getting your question answered. And if it comes to us or to Brian or through the GM, however, uh, we're going to commit to get back to you with more information. And we'd be glad to um, spend a little time at the site with you if you'd like to. Yeah. I'd like to, uh, uh, to offer that, number one. Number two, we uh, would like to get those camera locations pointed out to us so we could move them. And then we can uh, spend a little more time talking about the work that's going to be done on the facade that requires us to put the sheds there. So let's see if we could work something out. Okay. I'd, be, I'd be happy to do that. So, so thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. Thank you, Councilmember. Now we have Del Councilmember Diana Ayala, followed by Councilmember Mark Jonai. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to piggyback off what Council, uh, Councilmember Kuhl was asking regarding the scaffolding because it's, it's something that really um, I don't understand. Um, there seems to be an uptick in the number of developments that are now surrounded by scaffolding, but there was never any real clear um, explanation as to why there was a need to put up so much scaffolding so quickly and at so many developments at the same time, you know, so we can only conclude that there was an issue maybe with brickwork that had been done before mm -hmm. and maybe some sort of failed inspection. It would have been nice to have a little bit of clarity on that. I think some of the resident leaders would um, would express the same. Yes. However, I get, we get like, you know, so one, I would like to know what's happening with this, why scaffolding was put up, but wondering if there has been any conversation at NYCHA or between NYCHA and the DOB regarding the uh, the potential imp uh, implications to public safety that the scaffolding coupled with the new netting and the chain link fence, um, you know, put some developments at risk of. So uh, I'm going to answer uh, one part of the, uh, your question in terms of uh, getting information on why the scaffolding is there. We have uh, two ideas that we're going to be, um, I think, running out soon. One would be that we're going to use uh, construction signage on the scaffolding to talk about, hey, here's the date it went in, here's why it went in, and we're going to post that in um, uh, more than one language. and. Additionally, we're also looking to, and this one is, I would classify this as more of a demonstration. We want to put, just like when you're walking down the street and you, you go to the subway, you see the screens there that give you information on the trains, or we want to put those, try those in the lobbies so that if you come in, um, you're at the elevator, you could get updates on what's going on in the building that day, you could get updates on long-term projects like the scaffolding so that the communication about why it's there and for how long is, is better. Um, I want uh, uh, Stephen to talk a little bit about uh, the issues that we have when the scaffolding goes up and, under, and understand that. And I would only preface his comments by saying when we have facade work, um, it's, it's some of the most expensive work that we can undertake and um, also some of the hardest to do logistically, but um, if you could just kind of get to some of the questions the council member had. Yep, um, I'll, be, I'll be brief. The, uh, the sidewalk sheds that go up, the emergency shedding that goes up, that is legislated. Um, every five years there is a facade uh, review where a report is uh, implemented into the Department of Buildings system. If there is an unsafe condition within that facade, then within 24 hours, we're required to put up sidewalk sheds to protect the residents and the neighborhood from that particular element. Um, that doesn't give us a lot of time. Um, we're working with the developments to, to inform them as much time in advance. And then when we put those sidewalk sheds up that day, 
we, we walk over to the development office to make sure that the cameras are, um, you know, we look through the screens to make sure which ones of the cameras are blocked and which ones aren't to, to make changes to those cameras. Um, we're putting up a lot of sidewalk sheds, as you mentioned. Um, that's part of the legislation. And we recognize that there are every once in a while cameras that we're just not gonna hit. Um, definitely when they get brought to our attention, we immediately go out and make those changes so that way the cameras are there. Um, but then it comes the piece of the funding of the actual work that's associated to that wall. Um, it is a difficult portfolio for us. It's a big portfolio. And those funds are not capital eligible. They're not bond money. And so we have to look at other funding sources to do the work on local law 11 work. So that's either taking some of the federal dollars away from uh, the big federal capital projects that we're doing or the community development block grant money, which is what we usually use that, uh, some of those funds for. So in other words, the scaffolding has the potential to be there for a couple of more years before we identify funding. I get that, but I have a couple of concerns. And quite honestly, I'm annoyed because Millbrook, for instance, has scaffolding again, and they just did their brickwork three years ago, four years ago, so it should still be on the warranty. I don't, I don't understand like what, what happened. Um, and I get that you only get 24 hours to put up the scaffolding, but the scaffolding, in all fairness, has been up at those developments for months, and they still, to this day, do not know why the scaffolding went up. So at some point, even after the fact, it would have been nice to know because I've asked several times as well about you know why the scaffolding. So again, I, this is what I'm sharing with my resident leaders is that I can only conclude mm -hmm. that upon inspection, there was some sort of deficiency that was identified um, that the rest of us just don't know about. Um, I, I get that, I, I get that we have you know, horrible contractors that are doing work at NYCHA that we're dependent on. I'm not excited about that. I do not applaud that. I think that we do the city and NYCHA a disservice because we're spending money two and three times over for the same work. However, on the public safety, there's nothing I can do to change that immediately. I'm gonna, I'm gonna accept that. However, regarding the public safety, of the residents, there is a lot that we can do. And it's not just a matter of positioning and repositioning the cameras, which was an issue, but it's also an issue that the chain link, link fences are required to have a mesh, which five, six years ago was not a requirement. And that poses a, a safety issue of um, risk to the residents because sometimes you can't see. I will admit that in the last few years, we have changed the, the, the type of mesh. So I, I remember walking into Carver and it was like walking you know, into a maze. It was black mesh. You couldn't see out, you couldn't see in. We had an abundance of robberies that were occurring you know, during that time. They changed them to a more transparent one. It's still not the best. I have the most public housing of any member in this body, and I have a serious gun violence issue. Last summer, I had almost 30 shootings at my public housing developments. So right now, I'm terrified for what is to come this summer if now we're adding an additional issue that could potentially put people's lives at risk. So, you know, I get that, that we're required, we're mandated by law to do certain things, but it doesn't preclude us from being able to try to think outside of the box and figuring out how do we then ensure the public safety of these tenants because we recognize that these specific developments are having issues. That is, that is, a, a, that's, a, that's something that I really want a response to. And two, the scaffolding is also allowing for a, a significant accumulation of garbage at the public housing developments. And I, my understanding is that the contractors are supposed to clean on the opposite side of the, of the fencing, and the NYCHA staff can only clean on the outside. I'm not sure, but if you look at the developments, the, the, the fencing goes all the way to the bottom. So even if the staff attempted, they couldn't even reach the garbage because the fence goes all the way to the floor. So there's nowhere, there's no place to even put a broom in. Uh, but the large accumulation of garbage obviously is a problem when we're talking about you know the large 
uh, rodent infestation that we're also seeing. So, so there are a lot of things that, yes, are monetary at restrictions. However, there are other ways that we could be helpful. And two of those things on the top list of, of priorities this summer for me are obviously the, the scaffolding and the public safety um, issues that that poses for, 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 for my constituencies and also the amount of garbage accumulation that has been allowed to, um, to occur since the time that the scaffolding went up. Um, thank you. I think I, I have about five pieces here and I'll try yes. to respond to each of those. Um, you're absolutely right where it's a five-year cycle with the local law 11. So if you get a report and then the report goes in and it have an unsafe condition, immediately 24 hours you get the sidewalk sheds going up. If we identify funding for that particular element, so remember Local Law 11 is only that element that was an unsafe condition, the contractor goes in and takes care of those elements. That following year, you get the sidewalk sheds go down and then you're in that five-year cycle again. The five-year cycle does not start when the work ends. The five-year cycle is from the original five-year cycle. So immediately we have to put in the next report and if, let's say, for example, that brick was taken care of, or that section of the wall was taken care of, but if there's now same deterioration in that wall based on, on rain, snow, sleet, all of those issues, then all of a sudden now you have sidewalk sheds that go up for that section of the wall. And so it's a cycle, and we are working with um, our contractors to look at the building facades a little bit more holistically. That does cost more money, but we're, we're analyzing that to make sure that at the end of the day, we're not putting up sidewalk sheds and then doing the work that's associated to that specific report and then having to put sidewalk sheds up again in two years because, or a year because a different report goes in that identifies a different section of that facade that has the errors. Um, we do have a lot of contractors. Um, Greg mentioned the amount of spend that we're going through and the amount of uh, contracts that we have out there. Uh, we monitor those contractors. We have quality safety and construction. We have uh, assistant project managers that are and project managers that are going out to the field regularly, announced and unannounced. And uh, when we find that we have a bad actor, we, we move immediately to make sure that we can remedy that. I guarantee based on the percentages of contractors that we out have out there that we're gonna have some bad actors every once in a while. It's part of the industry, but it's very, very important for us to make sure that we identify them and then take action immediately to make sure that either they are not doing work for the city of New York or us again, but also that the work that we're putting in here is gonna last us. You know, if we put in a roof and it's got a 30 year warranty, I want that roof to last 30 years, period, because that's what they're paid for, that's what the contract is. And so we do have that staff. Um, in terms of working on the, the sidewalk sheds and the development, um, Greg mentioned the piece with the sign. Um, we've had some great conversations with council members. I, I actually uh, thank you very much for uh, hosting me at your offices to talk to you a little bit about some of the projects that are happening in your developments. Um, and, I, and I would say to any of the council members, our offices, are, our, our doors open all the time to go over these items. But we're going to uh, look at the electronic signage, but immediately what we are doing, and we, we have the, the pilot done, the, the, the poster is done. It's being corrected in Department of Communications and the CCOP would like to see it. But it will be a poster that will be put up in each of the development offices that identifies the work that is happening at the development as well as the date of completion. We recognize that not all the residents can go to the tenant resident meetings um, and we want to make sure that there's enough information out there so everyone can see what's going on because there is a lot of work that's happening at all of these developments. Council member, I've I, uh, been thinking about your comments on security and I wanted to offer um, we'd be glad to, uh, if we can, sit with you and get NYPD and before summer, uh, spend some time thinking about the places where the criminal activity uh, touches our properties and are there, a few th are there things that NYCHA could do differently in our thinking and planning for the uh, change of season? and do that in a collaborative way with uh, 
with NYPD where uh, we're getting some of their advice and feedback for anything that we might be able to do. So um, we'd very be very glad to spend time at the office and um, uh, work with you to see if there's some things that we could be very tangible and very targeted in terms of what we might try uh, both to support NYPD, but also to port, support the safety issue, or get to the safety issue. I, I would appreciate that. And in regards to the contractors and the garbage? So uh, they are supposed to uh, do that cleaning. Uh, Steve and I have talked about this. I said, I'm um, uh, not interested in paying someone who's not doing the entire job. So uh, if we, uh, we, I've instructed staff if we can to withhold payments and will, uh, because this repeats, uh, it's not the first time we've heard it. And also to Steve's earlier point, uh, we're going to evaluate that contractor in a way that folks know that the job was not, was not done. Um, I will say though that um, if we have that situation, we're willing to uh, uh, get the vendor out there to do the cleaning uh, when we're uh, when we've advised that it's lagging, and uh, I don't know, Vito, if you wanted to add anything to sure. that. Or <clears throat> so I, I just want to be clear that there are certain situations where the contractor is responsible for the cleaning and maintenance behind the fence and the sidewalk shed. Um, if it is a construction site, an active construction site, if the fencing and the sidewalk sheds are put up because of local law 11 to address the immediately hazardous concerns. <coughs> The contractor currently is not responsible for that. We're looking to address that. Right? We're also working with our partners, um, with the Teamsters, because even to send our staff into those areas require a certain OSHA certifica certification that not all of our staff currently have. So these are issues that, that and, and honestly, the, the next step of it too is we need to do a better job of one, communicating, and two, educating our residents right, when the sidewalk sheds are erected. So I think th there's a multi-pronged approach uh, and I would add uh, to what the chair said about the uh, meeting with NYPD. Um, you know, the Department of Buildings, at least in the last two years since I've been at NYCHA, they have been extremely helpful, um, especially in respect to this area. When we I first got there, we had sidewalk sheds. We had miles and miles of sidewalk sheds where it wasn't necessary. Right? And Capitol and DOB sat down and came up with a plan that addresses the safety concerns of not having sidewalk sheds and having sidewalk sheds. And I think that still is that's a work in progress. So I would invite the Department of Buildings to join us because again, they've been really helpful in dealing with these issues. No, I, I would really appreciate that because I think that you're more susceptible to becoming a victim of crime than you are yes. to getting hit by a brick, you know, in right. public housing. And, and uh, I, I think that's a very cogent assessment. I want to make sure people don't get hit in the head by yeah. either, but I, uh, no. I just want to make sure that people, are, you know, and I want to reiterate that, you know, for the most part, you know, 99% of the people that live in public housing are wonderful people, but we continue to see, you know, these issues arise year in and year out. And last year was just a really bad year for us in the 8th District. And I want to make sure that my residents, you know, feel safe when they're coming in and out of their homes because, you know, the rest of us get to go home mm -hmm. and, you know, we, we don't have to live with that day-to-day um, you know, uncertainty of what's what's to come. And, you know, I'm a baby of, of uh, public housing. I grew up in Lillian Wald in the 80s when, you know, it was not, you know, it, 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 was, not, it was not a fun time. You know, we saw many of our friends and family um, succumb to, to gun violence. And so we want to make sure that people just feel safe. Um, I just, I, I had a very quick question. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, just about regarding the, um, I'm sorry, Mark, real quick, regarding the, the electronic uh, temperature monitoring, I know that you're, there's, a, 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 there's a plan to, uh, to get to 44 developments before the end of this year, is that correct? Um, I, That's correct. I think so, yes, thank you. So just you know, want to put out there that we've been getting a lot of complaints for the developments that do have it regarding shortage of staff. I'm not sure if that's something that, um, that NYCHA is, is, is aware of or looking at uh, regarding the amount of time that it takes the staff that's supposed to be monitoring the new systems to get from one development to the other. This when, is the heating, the heating system, right? 
that you're talking about the heating system I'm talking I, about the heating system yeah. yeah we have added a, a significant number of staff to our heating department uh, this heat season uh, I think what folks might be talking about is that there are temperature triggers where the yes. system will shut off right but we have not seen any situation where these devices have been installed where it's dropped below what the minimum setting is and our minimum setting is significantly higher than what the local law requires I know so at Jefferson, great, yeah, at Jefferson a, Houses has been a problem um, all winter, and um, they have expressed some concerns about the amount of time that it takes um, the heating staff that monitors the new system to get to the development um, and feeling like they're yeah. And I, yeah so I um, our response time has been much better um, this year than even last year, and last year was a significant improvement over even the prior year. Um, we'd we would love could, to take you to our... Okay. Yeah, we could go over the development time, though. Yeah, but also I would love to take in, you to our yeah. center um, at LIC and show you how we have staff that monitor our systems 24-7. And right. what, is, what, we, is the, what is the total cost savings to NYCHA um, when you're done? What do you anticipate NYCHA will save once the, you transition the entire 44 developments? I don't know that we have that readily available, but we could certainly get back can, to you yeah. with that. We can. Okay. And um, let's uh, work with uh, Brian's office and set up a time so that we can actually start some of the security planning that yes. we've talked about. We, and our contribution, I think, can be thinking about uh, lighting, uh, cameras, uh, uh, any kind of dead spots where people might hang out, that kind of thing. And what could we do uh, ahead of the summer to maybe turn that knob down a little bit. I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Now we'll have Council Member Bill Perkins. Thank you very much. I just want to uh, commend you for the role that you have created for residents uh, to be a part of taking care of the homes where they live. I think it's very, very valuable for them to have that kind of uh, partnership, ownership, and in fact, it seems to me that we're not just talking about just the adult residents, but just as importantly, maybe even more importantly, yeah. the youth. And so I wanted to get a sense of how much of this youth involvement are we having in this very important uh, project that where you're inviting the, the tenants, and I hopefully I'm saying the youth, to be a part of. So we run a number of partnership programs that are focused on uh, youth at the property. And I would say this, we are open and are uh, pursuing um, almost any opportunity to engage youth in uh, anything from summer employment, internships, um, uh, working uh, uh, with us in ways that are appropriate given the age of the person. We are looking to expand uh, our relationship with Youth Build, which is the uh, group that works on uh, getting uh, youth into the construction trades. We met with them, uh, uh, I can't remember if it was earlier this year or towards the end of last year, about uh, we have a good partnership with them now, we wanted to open more sites and more recruitment. And we're also interested if um, uh, either any of the resident leadership or uh, council has ideas on how we can uh, strengthen that because I agree with you. I think if we can give uh, kids in those age brackets a chance to, to do something, see something different, you never know when that's gonna sure. open up somebody to a path that they might not have thought about. And I do think that um, uh, we'd be glad to talk uh, uh, with our uh, resident engagement group and see if there's specific things you might have in mind. But we're always thinking about this because we feel uh, that it's really important to have a chance for them to uh, contribute and, and step up. Thank you very much for, for that answer. I, I just hope that you feel comfortable you know, reaching out to us to make sure that we are engaged with you sure. uh, in this effort, and especially again, uh, where, when it comes our young people that can, are can, can out I add there. Can I add something else, uh, Councilman? Um, 
we're going to be engaged in these large-scale capital investments, whether we do it through the rental assistance demonstration um, and putting particular emphasis on making sure that when we do that kind of property that our uh, RAD partner is also reaching out and engaging folks at the site level. And the second thing I would say is, as we go down this road together, we're going to have to raise a lot of capital to reinvest in NYCHA. Mm. And there's going to be a lot of opportunities if we're successful in raising the capital to do things that directly impact our families. And I'm not just talking about the new kitchen or bath we hope to put in. Um, the way we see it, we've got three investments to make. We have to invest in the building, we have to invest in changing NYCHA's culture, and we have to invest in the families. And if we're successful in some of the capital funding things that we're hoping to do in the next couple of years, the ability to multiply that into a social impact is increased, and we're, we're up for taking that on. Thank you very much for that uh, response. And again, um, include us in any way you feel Surely. useful. And we appreciate the initiative that you're taking, and we want to make sure that we get as much support as possible from Thank you. at least from my office, and I'm sure my colleagues probably feel the same way. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, I just have uh, several more questions in a, a different uh, areas that I wanted to ask all of you today. Um, so I wanted to specifically ask about the NYCHA operated senior uh, club transfer. Many of those 14 senior centers in last year's budget were transferred over to DIFTA. Um, and as part of our budget, um, seven NYCHA managed senior centers were transferred to DIFTA. Mm -hmm. And then in the fiscal 2020 adopted budget, DIFTA was provided funding for one year only to manage an additional five NYCHA senior centers. The remaining two centers previously managed by NYCHA were closed. And as of June 2019, NYCHA no longer directly manages any of its senior centers. So my first question is, while many of them were baselined in the fiscal 2020 budget, which we're grateful for, um, is there a long-term strategy to secure funding for five senior centers that are only funded through this fiscal year? I, um, oh, thank you. It's at the top yes, of the list. Yes, we are. I'm sorry. We, we are working. Um, I apologize. We are working with OMB to think about how to get the money into these centers. So we don't want to represent that they're kind of dangling out there. And um, we want to address the needs at those centers and making sure that uh, we can do that while we're addressing our larger capital needs. So it's, it's on our radar. Yes. Okay. Well, I wanted to be at the top of your list. Uh, yes, and I also speak for myself and the largest champion we have for our seniors, and that is Council Member Margaret Chin. All right. If she were here, she would want you to put it at the top of your list. Uh, we also closed two centers. Uh, we closed Taft in Council Member Perkins District and Baisley Park in Council Member Adams Districts. Um, is that existing space currently open for residents to use? And is there a plan to reopen those centers? And if not, what will we do with that vacant space? So uh, Taft, uh, we hope um, it was reopened. It's open. Yes, it is open. Um, oh. We reopened it with some uh, discretionary funding we had in January. And the provider now is the Stanley Isaacs Neighborhood Center. OK. Um, the Baisley Park is not open for resident use. It is on, there are renovations occurring though at that site. Okay, so the minimal funding that you use to reopen Taft, does that cover you through the end of this fiscal year? That I do not know, and okay. I could have to get back to you on. Okay, great, okay, we okay. definitely wanna to continue to talk about that. No, I, I, I think what I'd like to do is, um, uh, we have, uh, because of the arrangements we have with the senior centers, I want to be sure we understand where the partner agencies are and what we're committing to in terms of uh, uh, either renovations or continued operation there. Okay. And what was the process by which um, we transitioned the existing NYCHA staff at those particular senior centers? Were they folded into NYCHA in 
general staff? Do you know where they went? Um, because we did have a conversation about trying to see if any of those NYCHA staff could be hired and picked up by the ultimate CBO mm. on the ground. So um, uh, there were, uh, yes, there were 18 staff assigned to those centers and they were afforded the opportunity to select positions with family partnership and community development departments uh, with CEP. CEP worked with Local 371 to ensure that that transition occurred and uh, the staff have uh, transitioned over to the new positions. Okay, great. And in terms of the operations, while I know that DIFTA oversees the senior centers, administers the contracts with those particular CBOs, um, in last year's budget, we put in several million dollars for capital work, renovations that, that needed to be done. Um, as one example, I have two of these 14, and one of them needed a significant amount of capital work, the other not so much. Uh, many of these centers were very small in terms of operations, no full food meal program. Um, is there some sort of a memorandum of understanding that exists today that outlines the responsibility of each agency, whether it's NYCHA, DYCD for the centers, mm -hmm. or DIFTA, or the not-for-profit providers? So we are actually in the process of drafting that. And We're just drafting that now? Yes. Oh, my it's, goodness. Uh, we yeah. are late. We are. And uh, uh, I'm not... To be candid, I'm not comfortable uh, without one because I think when you commit to writing with each other, you define the responsibilities of the parties. And uh, this is something where, uh, as we've done this transition, I think we have to step up and get the, the memorandum of understanding completed. Okay, so what I'd like to see, and if it's okay, City sure. Council, uh, we will work with the 14. I mean, we can work with those particular council yeah. members. I can tell you with my two, there's still outstanding capital work that needs to be addressed, and it has not always been a productive conversation with DIFTA in terms of additional money that is needed to bring these centers up to full capacity. Um, and so I want to have that conversation now because if there's additional money that is sure. needed, we need to make sure that's reflected in the budget. No, and I, I think part of the thing that we're talking about here is structuring ourselves in a different way with the memorandum of understanding so it's clear who's doing what, who's contributing what, and then uh, to your point, figuring out what that, what that capital uh, would look like and where that's coming from. Okay. Do you have a time frame on when you think that would be? Um, I don't, and I, but I want to go back and talk to the parties, and I could get you uh, an answer when we're thinking about certainly circulating a draft and being able to meet. Okay. And okay. the reason I ask that question also is the one of the underlying factors that we mm -hmm. have to consider with the operations of these senior centers today, there are ongoing inspections that are happening, and right. there are agencies that are visiting these centers, and some of them are being given fines that someone has to pay, right? And so yeah. the quicker we get an MOU where we delineate who's responsible for what, the quicker we can really address a lot of those outstanding No, we issues. very much agree with you. And, okay, because uh, they'll call us, Chair. They call yeah. us. <laughs> okay, and let them know that we're, we're coming to kind of help straighten this out. We're not going to let it sit. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to ask about community centers, another favorite topic of mine. Um, earlier this year in February, the mayor outlined his State of the City address in which he announced plans to reopen five community centers at certain NYCHA developments. It wasn't outlined exactly where they were. Uh, do you know where those centers are located? And will these newly constructed centers um, or will existing centers undergo renovations? So, so two questions, brand new centers and sure. or existing. So um, uh, they were identified. We are currently, uh, this is currently vacant spaces at NYCHA Developments, and we are working to notify the tenant associations before we make the list public, and as soon as we do, we will. And so this is previously unoccupied spaces and there will need to be renovations before that we can make them operational. So I hope to have the name soon, and then we hope to also be able to give a sense of what work is going to be required to make them operational. 
Okay, so two questions from that. Mm -hmm. The funding for the capital work that's necessary, will that be reflected by the executive budget? And number two, will this be a new RFP to determine which not-for-profit will run these community centers? I, I cannot answer that. Okay. I don't know All at right. the moment. To be but determined. No, we could, we could make sure that we get that answer to you, but I, I don't know at the moment. Okay. Okay, to be determined. I uh, wanted to ask about the elevator action plan. I think the general manager knows, like next to community centers and senior centers, I am always talking about elevators. Super important. Um, in January, the NYCHA monitor approved a corrective action and response plan outlining our steps to reduce elevator outages and no service conditions at 3,200 elevators that were owned by NYCHA. The elevator service and repair department manages the elevator operations and consists of 473 full-time staff. So my first question is, do we have any vacancies in the elevator service and repair department? And if so, how many? And do we have plans to fill those vacancies? Yeah. So I am going to give my seat up to Joey Koch. Okay. Ask her to please. The elevator her. champion, the yes, elevator now champion. chief of yeah. staff, but always prioritizing elevators. And we always say that Joey's more up than down, so. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, agreed. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. I'm Joey Koch, uh, Chief of Staff at NYCHA. But yes, I, I am a champion of all things heat and elevators yes. for, for NYCHA. Um, so we actually hired a, about 20 additional elevator teams. Um, they are either all hired or in the process of being hired. There was a list call. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're in the process of bringing all of those on board. Okay. And the agreement requires NYCHA to replace or address at least 425 elevators by 2024. Are we on track to meet that obligation? We are currently on track to meet that obligation. Okay, and this is a full replacement? These are full modernizations, right, full, right. full replacements. Okay, I'm excited. I meet you. I mean, 2024 is a little ways away. It's a long away, way. It's a long way. I'm still excited. I know. And have you decided, has the de uh, authority decided yet of that 425 elevators, which developments will receive the highest priority based on outages, malfunctions, et cetera? Do we have that list already? Yeah, so those have been identified and it has been based on the PNA, the physical needs assessment mm -hmm. and outage, historical outage history. That is always subject to change as issues arise that may require an elevator to be in worse shape than it was when we originally made the list. So it's potentially up for revisions, but they have been identified. Okay, and according to the uh, physical needs assessment, uh, about 1.5 billion is required to repair and replace elevators across the portfolio. Um, how much funding have we already dedicated to implementing the provisions um, outlined in the elevator action plan? Do we have 1.5 billion? Are we close? Uh, yeah. No, there, we don't yeah. have the 1.5. We have a portion of the state funding Okay. Uh, and we probably have some uh, capital. We do. I don't know that number, though, Steve. So a combination of, you're talking about the Federal. 450 million from the, the state? state? Right, that right? portion of that funding is going to elevators. Mm -hmm. Plus what uh, we're putting in. 100 million. 100 million. 100 million is elevators. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, do we have federal capital for yep. elevators? Sorry, um, we have both uh, the action plan funds as well as federal dollars and some city dollars that are going into elevators. Okay, so what's the total total of what we have between federal dollars, the action plan, money from the administration, plus this, the 100 million you already d described? Is the, there a total? Yeah, there is a, there is a total dollar amount. Um, We're gonna have to get back to you with the action. Let, let us, the yeah, I don't okay. wanna add, I don't wanna add wrong. Yeah. Okay, no, no, okay, I understand. But we can I wasn't get, a math major either. Yeah, no, that was my, I struggled. 
<laughs> I just want to, again, and the reason I say that, I mean, uh, Vito, you know how important, we all yeah. know how important elevators are. I do nothing but talk about elevators and windows all day. Um, and as close as we can get to the 1.5 uh, billion, yeah. and I think it recognizes that in the physical needs assessment, you know, elevators are a critical part. Just like roof and boiler are, I'm not saying that they're not, but elevators, we have an expectation when we get in, we need to get to our location. And I remind you, Chair, I have a senior center in my district that is on the 20th floor Lord. of a building that's 24 stories. And I'm reminded of, of the staff and everyone else in this yeah. particular building. And we're currently, we have $2 million for that building, thankfully, and we're going through design. So I would love to see that in other places, particularly since some of these developments may not have a lot of outages, mm -hmm. but it still means that there is a priority to replace that elevator. No, thank you. Uh, because we agree and uh, with the capital money that we have and the capital money we hope to raise, uh, we do want to get to the entire portfolio. We don't want to miss anyone. Okay. So one more question, Ms. Koch. The 20 new staff, is that added on to 473? That's in addition? Yes. I, I, we added an additional 20 teams, so it's 40 people. Off the top of my head, I okay. don't I remember, but I think it is. It is. Okay, it is. Okay. CFO has confirmed. Yes. Okay, got it. And I want okay. to thank you for your contribution to the... Absolutely, yes. and I hope in my last two years I can give more. I make no promises, though. I have to get to a lot of other parts of well, my NYCHAs. If you do, we're going to spend better than we have. Yes, so. yes, we yes. will, we will. Um, I wanted to ask about the homeless set-asides in public housing. Um, I believe we started in 2017. We started to dedicate 1,500 units per year for homeless families that were referred by DHS. Um, do you know how many formerly homeless families we've placed in NYCHA under this set-aside policy to date? and how many we intend to place in 2020. Um, are we aware? Yes, we are. And uh, I got to get the general manager to, he has okay. the data. And is that a set number? Are we, we have firm committed, on 1,500? Well, we've committed to certain amounts each year on the homeless okay. set aside. But, I'd, but <coughs> I'd, if you've got an update, that'd be great on where we are this year. So we've been tracking Thousand, I think. Um, our production units um, on a daily basis. Yeah. So okay. we are on target to uh, deliver uh, approximately 2,000 for this year. And we are using a combination of both in-house staff as well as contracted staff. Okay. How many ha have we done 1,500 from 2017 each year? Did we meet that target? Do you know? Because you said 2,000 this year, but that's right. just for 2020, right. correct? So last year we completed approximately 1,700. Okay. Okay. Got it. And how much subsidy does NYCHA receive from the city to place these formerly homeless families? We received 28 million. That's, a, that's the to amount to date, or is that annual? Amount to date to expedite apartment prep. Okay. And as far as placing formerly homeless families in any of these units, what happens in situations where the unit needs work? Are we responsible, or does DHS cover the cost of that? We're doing that, right? So, so after occupancy? Yes, for so a formerly homeless family to occupy a NYCHA apartment. We make the repairs. Yes. Okay, we make the repairs. Okay, got it. Um, I wanted to ask, you talked a lot about energy efficiency and sustainability in NYCHA, and I want to bring up another topic that I consistently talk about, and that's windows. Uh, NYCERTA, the state agency dedicated to energy research and development, um, used to have weatherization programs, and right. so does uh, Homes and Community Renewal, DHCR. Do we have any existing weatherization programs, and how would we be able to provide 
replacement of windows to many of our NYCHAs. I think about a few of mine, like Claremont Consolidated, that are low rises. They have poor heating, but the reason why their heat is poor is because the windows are in poor condition. So no matter how much heat we provide, even if it's at its maximum, poor insulation means that you can't feel the heat anyway. And I mentioned this to the monitor, Mr. Schwartz, when he was here at our last hearing, because I think it's important to invest further in weatherization programs where we can replace many windows that need to be replaced. So um, we do have currently the energy performance contracts I mentioned, but I want to say that we're interested in a more uh, ambitious approach. The Boiler work that we're doing with the state funds, for example, uh, we're not going to replace those boilers in kind. We're going to try to bring more efficient and different systems. And uh, when we start making those kinds of investments, we'd like to circle back to the partners that you mentioned and see if there's any way we could pick up uh, additional funding for things like windows and other weatherization. Um, these are expensive items in terms of replacing windows at the scale we're talking about, but we'd be game to talk to folks because if we can change both the boiler and the uh, outside, the, uh, the wall and the window, uh, that would lead to even more efficiency and, and really give us a leg up on um, uh, trying to save energy. So right now, do we have any money in our capital designated to window replacement? And I understand the logic of what you're saying. Are we looking at opportunities at any state grants? Um, it's really frustrating, Chair. I am asked as a council member to fund window replacements at my developments. And I'm not NYCHA. I don't have that kind of money. Right. And I shouldn't have to replace windows at my NYCHAs. But I should expect that whatever revenue stream we can identify. Is there sure. anything today that we have dedicated we, to window replacements? We have $10 million in weatherization. I can't okay. tell you that that is uh, exclusively for windows, but I could get back to you and tell you what that money is for. Okay. What other examples would it be used for besides windows? Well, it could be used for various ceiling uh, okay. sealants or, uh, you know, cutting Ceiling, drafts window. or... Um, I'm going to step in here. Go ahead, please. So we do have weatherization programs, and we are working with the state um, at this point in time. Uh, we have uh, $450,000 in weatherization programs uh, in construction, and those are things for it is re uh, refrigerators, Energy Star, windows are included into that lighting and mm -hmm. ventilation. Um, we're also thinking about comprehensive modernization on some of our portfolio. And when we talk about comprehensive modernization, we are thinking about the whole building envelope. And so we are thinking about windows associated to that. And what are the guidelines and metrics that you use with the existing weatherization programs that you're talking about to determine which developments get priority? So are these developments that are not in queue to get a brand new boiler? Um, is it based on 311 calls? Is it based on the property managers, the resident associations? Like, how are we determining which developments that we could start with for the existing weatherization money? So it has a lot to do with the grant itself, um, but most of the weatherization programs happen in the scattered sites. The scattered sites, okay. The smaller uh, buildings that, are, that might not get a full boiler replacement, they mm -hmm. may not be able to, they may not be having a, a, a part of a large roofing program. Um, there are smaller developments of one to four family homes, um, maybe 45,000 residents. That, those are the type of developments in which the weatherization program is focused on. Okay, great. So I would love to talk further about that as we expand yeah. on the weatherization program because in addition to scatter site, I would also say some of the consolidated buildings and developments where there are low rises, um, they have fire escapes, they have no elevators, they're just walk-ups. Um, but generally speaking, many of them are probably old and in need right. of, um, so, of some attention. So I just want to put that on your radar. Okay. And uh, I would say that we are seeing examples at some of the, uh, I mean, uh, at some of the RAD conversions where they're doing uh, both the windows and the exterior cladding. Mm -hmm. 
And um, that's something that we will look at uh, where we can. Uh, it's, a, it's a big lift, though, in terms of cost, and it's a big, both for the window and the cladding. But um, to your point, the places where they're doing it are the low-rise buildings. And right. it looks, actually looks very attractive and also has the advantage of really just changing the energy profile for that building right. completely. No, some of the developments I'm thinking about that I would hope can be considered mm -hmm. for weatherization are not in the RAD program. Sure. Um, so they have no, again, there's no opportunity that would bring them a replacement of windows. And we, when we talk about our capital need over the next few months, we'll talk about what we're, we hope and what our ambition is for raising capital for the, the non-RAD uh, pipeline. Okay. Um, since we are now beginning the 2020 census, in light of everything going on, that's something that's not stopping. Residents of NYCHA have had a reluctance to participate and be counted because of the fear that the information will be shared with government, with HUD, with landlord, uh, with other agencies like law enforcement. Um, has NYCHA adopted any policies or any communication on the ground with your property managers, your the CCOP or any of the leaders to resonate that that is not the case and emphasize the importance of participating in the census. So we are collaborating with uh, New York City Census 2020 office. Okay, and, Julie Manon's office? Um, yes. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, our uh, a couple things. We're going to do a direct mail notice explaining the census and emphasizing uh, the protections that you have when you respond. We want to send this notice to all 171,000 households in April with the rent statement and um, share that on the rest of our communications platforms. Before we send it out, we'll likely sit with the CCOP and uh, brief them on it as well. And um, also, uh, uh, we will be uh, conducting outreach or supporting the outreach effort um, so that we're able to communicate to residents how important it is to respond uh, so that they can be counted. Okay. And I also want to just be mindful of language access. Yes. And some of the changes this year with the census where you can conducted, you can participate online. Um, there's a lot of things that can happen now before the enumerators and the physical visits do happen. Right. So I think it's important to make sure that the message resonates, that we're not sharing this information, particularly people that may fear that their benefits would be in jeopardy. Yes, and if right. they are right. including residents as of April 1st that may or may not live in their household. That has been the growing concern. We'd be glad to share language with you and, and get your uh, comments, but uh, we will be working with uh, the 2020 office to, to get to those points. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask about the alternative working schedule, AWS. I used to call it flex op, I think. Um, and the recently, um, enacted labor agreement with Teamsters, with Local 237, and how that relates to frontline staff, um, evening shifts, weekend shifts. Um, is this in the entire development? Do we have AWS today? Um, is it still being phased in? And how do you ensure with an alternative work schedule, work is still being done, garbage is still being picked up, Vito knows I had a situation this week, and then how does that also impact the weekend blitz initiative that we have? So a uh, couple things, and then I'm going to turn it over to the, to the <coughs> uh, general manager. Uh, as um, we've discussed and mentioned, this is uh, both on the caretaker side and also with the recent arbitration on the maintenance worker side. It has been rolled out uh, to all properties at the present time. Um, I want to give Vito a chance to weigh in and just give you a sense of where we are with this and, and what we're working on. Okay. Sure. So thank you. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, AWS, the implementation for caretakers, um, the rollout began last March, um, and all developments now have AWS uh, for caretakers. And we've gone basically from a Monday through Friday 8 to 4.30 schedule to a seven-day-a-week operation. Um, from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. And you know, for full transparency, 
and we've had some bumps. Um, and again, it's been a, a pretty big change for a lot of our staff to kind of um, understand and to implement. Uh, so to that end, we have done extensive training. We will continue to do training at the developments where they're still struggling with the implementation of AWS, and we're bringing in a consultant to assist with that. So that's with, with respect to the caretakers. Now, AWS, when we negotiated the terms with the Teamsters, um, we were able to hire an, an additional 210 caretakers right, as part of the negotiations. Um, and again, 70% of those were residents um, with those new hires. Chair mentioned that we um, recently received a decision uh, from an impasse arbitrator right, um, for AWS for maintenance workers. Mm -hmm. Their schedule will, be, schedule will be slightly different. Right? They will not be working seven days a week. Again, we try to, we're trying to be respective um, of our residents and what we've heard from residents is that they would prefer not to have normally scheduled maintenance work on Sundays. So this will be a six day a week schedule okay. and the hours will be from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Yeah. six days a week. Okay. Right. And there will be maintenance workers who will be working Sundays mm -hmm. uh, to address emergency conditions. Okay. So Sundays would only be emergencies? Yes. For maintenance workers? Correct. Right. And in addition to which, um, on March 3rd, um, we signed uh, an MOU with electricians, right, also uh, for an alternative work schedule. And their work schedule will mirror the same as the maintenance workers. So our intent is to roll AWS out to almost all of the skilled trade titles. Right? Not every position would necessitate an AWS work schedule, uh, but we're aggressively moving forward um, to expand this through other titles. Okay. How can it will affect weekend blitzes. Mm -hmm. The weekend blitzes have been extremely successful and we believe that they should be continued. As long as we notify the developments in a sufficient time so that residents can make sure that they're home on Saturdays and we let them know that it only applies to a certain amount of work. Um, Saturday blitzes does not, as I understand, it, it doesn't include emergency work. It's just basic repairs, correct? Or is it vice versa? So the weekend blitzes are just really for um, maintenance work orders? Maintenance work, right. Correct. And we do provide three notices to the residents in advance of the um, AWS work schedule. Okay, no, it's gotten better. Yeah. I It was a bumpy start at the beginning. I admit that, I acknowledge that, but it's gotten much better. The first and foremost is to let the electeds know, the yeah. TA leaders, um, many instances so that we can make sure that people are home. And then also the second part of it to make it successful is the workers have to show up on Saturday. I don't want to hear that residents stayed home and then no one showed up. Like, we shouldn't have those types of, of I issues. I agree with you 100%. Okay. Um, and the information that I provided with respect to AWS for, um, for the electricians, that is only for the electricians that are assigned to developments. We do have electricians that are assigned to special units, okay. um, such as heating and elevators. They have a different work schedule. Right? We can kind of, if you like, we can provide you with uh, more details about the work schedules, but they do work um, seven days a week if they're assigned to a unit that supports either heating and or elevators. Mm -hmm. and, and we're currently negotiating an AWS schedule for our elevator mechanics as well. Okay. And how do you ensure with an alternative work schedule that you have a sufficient amount of staff, both maintenance workers and caretakers, assigned to large developments. So the issue that I have as one example, where we've been asking for a deconsolidation between Andrew Jackson and Morrisania Air Rights, because we share staff, we share a property manager, and the workload and the volume is heavy. It's not even a large development with respect to population. So it's not as big as Morris or Eden Wall or Gun right, Hill, right. you know, large developments in terms of units, but the work, the volume is heavy. So yeah. we've been asking for consideration to deconsolidate both so that we do not share staff. 
even though we're right across the street from each other, you guys know that we've struggled in the past with just maintaining a sufficient amount of staff. So under AWS, how do we ensure developments like what I just described, there's enough staff on a rotation where all of the issues can be addressed? Go ahead. Go ahead. So, so AWS really um, is to expand work hours. Say it again? I, I said AWS really is to expand work hours and where we can within the existing framework, framework of the budget to increase headcount, similar to what we did with caretakers. Um, I think what the chair mentioned earlier too is our focus on hiring up additional frontline field staff, and I think that those two go hand in hand. And I want to say I was, uh, went to uh, see uh, uh, Mr. Yelverton last week. We actually had a very productive meeting with his uh, resident council membership. We walked the site together. Uh, we talked about a number of the issues as he sees them. So we are working with, with him and with that tenant association, and I'm hoping um, to come back for some ideas with him about uh, what he sees as some of the issues at that property um, beyond adding the staff. I want to just be clear that when we did the 2020 budget, the one I mentioned in the testimony, we made a conscious effort to shift money into the field. And um, we're going to continue to do that inside the boundaries that the funding uh, uh, gives us. Uh, we're doing it now as part of the monitorship agreement in the sense that we have to do a, a transformation plan. We actually have to reorganize the housing authority. But um, the kinds of things that we're talking about here, changing the schedule, making sure we have sufficient staff, and then also meeting with uh, the tenant associations, because I know Mr. Yelverton, I'm in touch with him quite a bit, and um, we, have a, we, had a, we had a good walk and a good conversation about what he sees as our shortcomings and uh, committed to work together to see if we could get that turned around at his site. He has a tough site. Uh, but uh, you already know, know that, so, um, but we are working with him in a very direct way. Okay, and coupled with the alternative work schedule and making sure we have sufficient staff, caretakers, maintenance workers on the ground, um, how are we dealing with the outstanding work orders and the backlog? Um, the last time we met in the Bronx, we talked about developing a better system to make sure that a work order that is actually closed is closed because the work, work has been complete and not just because the worker closed the work order. Um, and then we talked about reducing um, duplicative work orders because residents were home and no one came or vice versa, just a combination of many, many right. different things. Um, it's a tall order, but are we making any progress on shifting and really revamping the whole work order system? So uh, we have, uh, as part of the reorganization that I mentioned, and I want to be clear that um, sometimes you hear the word reorganization and folks say, oh, this is just moving the boxes around on the paper. We, we're actually compelled by the monitorship agreement to make uh, structural changes. Uh, we're looking at um, having a crew come in as part of this to go through the work order process with us and to um, help us amend and revamp along the lines that we discussed when we visited. So that is going to be part and included in the plan um, for restructuring, which um, should be released in draft, we hope, in May and then uh, would go to the monitor for his review in uh, June. So it's on the radar. Uh, we're going to get some help to do it, and we're going to have uh, specific recommendations on how to get to some of the issues you described. So that's in the works. Okay. And will that also include some of the specialty uh, workers as well, carpentry, bricklaying, electrical, painting, plastering, yes. plumbing, welding? It's going to look at both. The okay. issues you raised about the closed, and then it's going to look at how can we do a better job sequencing work and, okay. um, uh, you know, making sure that, um, that, that it, 
it's a much tighter process than what we have now. Okay. Um, can you explain to me what the NYCHA CARES program is about? I see there was $20 million for fiscal 2019 and 2020 to support this program. Sure. So that $20 million was a one-time allocation um, from the mayor uh, to reduce open skilled trade work orders. And we actually um, spent about $27 million. Million, right? Yes, million. Okay. Yes. Oh. Yeah. I have a lot of numbers. Oh, oh, you got an update? Yeah. Um, so, so we were able to um, address, I, I'll look for the exact numbers, but we were able to address um, approximately 50,000 skilled trade work orders um, within 14 developments. Now, when I say 50,000, what we did was we identified developments with a high number of open skilled trade work orders, and we looked at the aging of those skilled trade work orders. We identified 14 developments. We sent in teams that consisted of uh, multiple skilled trade workers. But the, and when they went into those apartments, not only were they looking to address the open work orders, they were creating work orders to identify, uh, to address problems that they identified. So when they left that apartment, um, all of the work was completed. Is that a program that will continue through this year as well since? No, that was a one-time allocation. We have other programs that replicate the type of work that we did through NYCHA CARES. Okay, so we don't need $20 million anymore? Excuse me? We don't need $20 million anymore for New York? I don't know that I would. <laughs> for I, I wouldn't say cares. that. Yeah. And I think we need a little bit more than 20 Listen, if you don't ask, you won't receive. Uh, don't worry. We intend That's to ask. That's my philosophy. We will. No. Okay. Um, the uh, final two questions, I do want to go back just to the coronavirus uh, since it's uh, so relevant to <coughs> now and all the different systems that we have to continuously put in place. Um, in your interagency coordination with DOH, MH, with DIFTA, with DYCD, with OEM and the administration, um, will we look to identify some sort of an emergency like response plan? So again, not knowing how long this is going to be in effect, how many more new cases we will receive that are confirmed. Um, this is a national crisis. The president is talking now about declaring like a national emergency at the federal level, right? Um, and so because we're talking about over 400,000 residents that live in our developments and their families and many are vulnerable, seniors, those with disabilities, I've talked to several residents that have children and adults that are confined to their home. They are disabled, they take medication every day, and so I'm not worried about their exposure on the outside, mm -hmm. but I'm worried about what happens if we have to evacuate or get them out of their home. That's my concern. Um, and so it's almost like emergency disaster preparedness, similar conversation. Are we working on some sort of an emergency response that we will ultimately develop uh, for our residents and families? I, I would say that our conversations uh, with the partner agencies and among ourselves has been directed towards um, uh, planning around um, what happens if we identify uh, someone who's positive what happens if there has yep. to be a quarantine? Yep. And what That's are the things, uh, and just talking at a high level for a minute, what are the things we have to do to help that family get through that period? Uh, and how do we uh, work with our partners to make sure that um, uh, they're not compromised in some way? And how do we continue to provide services in the rest of the building? So we have been discussing this and also discussing it with our partners uh, in terms of trying to figure out um, delivering, uh, making sure that folks have access to what they need, especially if they're quarantined, and, and supporting those efforts uh, with the partner agencies. So um, uh, there is likely, um, uh, sooner or later we'll have a case but we think that the conversations we've been having have been pretty strong ones and we're going to have a coordinated response when we do. Okay, 
great. All I ask is that it's really important, and I know it's challenging to get a lot of information out fast to thousands of residents. And thankfully, we have systems in place like robocalls and emails, even down to phone calls. Right. Property managers on the ground level should be calling their presidents, right, um, and their executive boards at the local level. Um, my only fear is that people are just not aware. And I want to make sure that even if it's a matter, even in my own building where I live, we've posted signs all over public spaces to let people know about precautions mm -hmm. and things you can do. Seeking medical assistance, calling 311, making sure, you know, basic things. A lot of it is a behavior change, yeah. but it's also about what we expose ourselves to as well and things we can do a little bit differently. Um, and so it's my hope that over the next few days and weeks, I don't want to say months, um, that we will continue to expedite information in terms of communication with every channel and every resource we have. And we have, we have pushed out a lot of information to, uh, in the manner you described and um, has, I can't remember the number, you have the numbers? So <clears throat> I think in total, yeah. it's approximately 700,000 communications that have gone out to both residents as well as staff. It's a combination of robocalls, um, emails. We put a pop-up on our MyNYCHA app. Um, so when you access MyNYCHA app, which we have about 90,000 users, um, there's a pop-up and there's a link directly to the Department of Health, um, specifically for coronavirus. Um, there's push notifications, and I believe there are about 6,000 um, subscribers for the push notifications. We have put flyers, one-pagers, FAQs, up at each of our developments in every building, every management office. We've put up posters, and all of these efforts are in multiple languages. And okay. That's just some of what we're doing, not mm -hmm. all of it. Um, in addition to which, we kind of have a, like for lack of a better word, a war room um, at 250 Broadway where senior management, we meet now twice a day um, to discuss specifically issues that come up on a daily basis with respect to coronavirus. Okay, and as we continue to have conversations, and I guess this is the same conversation we're having with the Department of Education um, about a full closure of schools, and my fear with many of my children and families who live in temporary housing, um, schools are lifelines for them, right? They expect to get breakfast and lunch, medical services, and so, I, and I say the same thing to you, working with DIFTA as far as senior centers and DYCD as far as our community centers and cornerstones where you have seniors and children right. together. Um, should there be a decision that's made where we have to limit some of that access, it's my hope, and we say the same thing to the DOE, if we have to do a full school closure, we have to identify a way to get meals to seniors and to make sure that young people have some place to go. That is my fear, is that if we close and limit access, seniors and young people have nowhere to go. And obviously we have to always think about their their health and safety right. as primary right. um, importance. But also I'm thinking about the gap, right, and the void that's going to be created in terms of service. So, so I, again, just want to keep that on your radar because I don't know what's going to happen in the next days and weeks ahead. No, thank you. We have been um, running that scenario out amongst ourselves and with the partners. Um, I mean, it would be unprecedented, obviously, but uh, we're, very, we're very cognizant of the services you described and making sure that NYCHA's role is, is to facilitate um, uh, and help uh, those families if we wind up in a no school or quarantine situation or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, my final question is around the Mayor's Neighborhood Action Plan. This was a plan we started a few years ago where we looked at neighborhood map. There are 15 NYCHA developments identified that had the highest uh, level of violence, and we've poured, literally poured, a lot of resources into these 15. The three in the Bronx are Butler, Castle Hill, and Patterson. And those three developments have gotten cameras, 
exterior lighting, the community centers have extended hours. We've done a ton of things. When NYPD was here last week, we asked the new chief of housing, Chief Barrera, mm -hmm. about the idea and the possibility of expanding on those 15, simply because we know there are other developments near the 15, across the street, adjacent, next door, that equally have challenges, but they're not as high in crime. So what we don't wanna say, and we've had to say, because we prioritize, sorry, your development doesn't have as much crime as Butler or Patterson, so that's why they're getting a lot of stuff. So what I wanna understand is, are we having conversations today with Mock J, NYPD, and others, DYCD, around a possibility of expanding, and if so, do you have an idea of what that would look like? Yeah. So uh, we're very interested in aligning our capital work and initiatives with what NYPD uh, wants to do in those neighborhoods. And uh, we're also would very much like to uh, work with them and have proposed this. We, I would not suggest that we're in a formal planning stage yet. Okay. Uh, we'd like to over time align our camera systems. Uh, we very much uh, think that that would be a way for us to um, give them uh, access uh, that we, we currently can't unless we take a DVD and run it over there. I know, uh, that's a big problem now. Yeah, and uh, both Vito and I have uh, talked, we've raised it to NYPD and we're looking to do further discussions with them on how we might make that a project. Okay. So, so that's that's one thing that we've talked about that we're actually interested in um, making an investment in because we think that benefits them, it benefits us, and it benefits uh, the community. Mm -hmm. And also in the same conversation, a lot of frustration we hear from NYPD and most of our NYCHA developments are under a PSA, right? Very few are under the local precinct. Right. When the companies that install the sidewalk sheds and scaffoldings, again, I don't know what their metrics and guidelines are, but I will tell you, every camera is covered and every exterior light is covered too. Mm. So another reason as what Diana Ayala was saying and why people get so upset is because they're surrounded by scaffolding. The whole development is in scaffolding. The cameras are covered and it's almost an invitation to be a victim of a crime because you can't see anything, NYPD can't see anything, and then the lights are covered too. So is there any way that we can have conversations with the companies we work with to keep that in mind as they install so scaffolds? They have to go up, but you don't I have know, to cover the camera. Lights and camera. There we, well, go ahead, do you wanna go? So I was, if I can just start and I'll head off to Stephen. Um, you know, I think what you're talking about were challenges that we were faced with before. And I think the communication between Capitol, the Office of Safety and Security, and the developments is much improved. So when sidewalk sheds are required, there is a coordinated effort, there is a walkthrough of the development to see whether or not cameras and or lighting needs to be moved in advance of installation of the sidewalk sheds. I'm not going to suggest that there haven't been situations where even through those best efforts, um, we still have blocked um, cameras. Mm -hmm. And when we do identify those, we react very quickly. And we need to do better with respect to that. With respect yes. to the lighting, uh, lighting is required um, under the sidewalk sheds. Um, so yes, there have been situations where existing lighting might be blocked by the, uh, by the installation of a sidewalk shed, but all of our sheds are required to be up to code, um, which includes sufficient lighting. Okay. 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 So I am finished with all of my questions, but I like to go down my list and make sure I summarize so that you don't forget anything we've asked in terms of follow up. So we talked about the state funding, right? Yes. We talked about all the different funding streams that came from the state. And I would love to continue to talk about any updates on the outstanding projects, uh, both with DASNY as well as our money that we're overseeing, the $450 million. 
Um, we've also talked about the city capital commitment rate and how we're going to work with OMB on an organizational change. We have a new staffer coming in and we want to see some right sizing of the portfolio because the commitment rate is obviously there, but we right. want to look at some changes, right, in a more exactly. timely fashion. Yep. Yes? Yes. Okay. And we are also going to be anxiously awaiting the plan on how we are going to address the $8.9 billion gap that's left in the overall $32 billion capital plan after NYCHA RAD, NYCHA PACT, sure. and some of the other measures, right? Yep. Um, we are going to prioritize, because Council Member Chin wants us to, um, our senior centers, the ones that were not baseline, the five that were only funded through this fiscal year, and then you're going to give us an update about Taft, right? Yes. Um, because we put in a little bit of money in that, and then I don't know if there's a final plan you have for Baisley Park in Queens, but please let us know about that as we well. And we'll also update you on the MOU that we discussed. Yes, the as MOU. Well. Um, the new community centers, we're going to get some more feedback on that. The underutilized vacant NYCHA, the five, and then any new, new centers that the mayor has proposed in his state of the city address, okay. correct? Yep. Okay, and do I have any more? You're gonna keep us posted on the homeless set aside. Uh, Vito, you said that we are on pace to set aside 2,000 this year in 2020. So I just wanna make sure that we're still good with that. And the elevator action plan, we're going to do some follow-up to see how we can get to the $1.5 billion when we do the numbers and add up all the different levels of funding from the state, from the feds, from the action plan, from City Hall, as well as council members. Don't forget my $2 million. And then you're also going to keep us posted around the coronavirus um, and what we're doing with the pandemic and how we are um, engaging residents and stakeholders on the ground, any plans that need to be put in place, contingency to make sure that services are still available for young people as well as for the seniors. I definitely wanna do that. Um, and then we're also going to be talking about the work order backlog yes. and that plan, right, that we're yes. going to come out with. And that'll be part of, uh, we're going to be, when we do the restructuring plan, mm -hmm. we're looking at uh, the work order process. We'll be looking at AWS, and uh, we're also looking at uh, recertifications. Okay. And then also keep us updated on the 2020 census and your work with Julie Menon and her team. Um, we can be helpful as well. Many sure. of us are doing outreach ourselves. We're going to avail our district offices, some of us, to be a pop-up site with the U.S. Census because we want to make sure that we're doing our part, particularly since New York Public Library announced that the libraries are going to be uh, closing and they were a partner and they were going uh, to offer okay, services sure. too. So again, that's going to be a limitation, but it doesn't stop us from doing our work as right. well. Um, and then if there's any further update on the caretakers, the maintenance workers, the uh, work with Local 237, please, please continue to update us on the weekend blitzes so that we're able to let our residents on the ground know about that. And then finally, uh, any ongoing conversations with Mock J and NYPD about the Neighborhood Map Program. And once again, please don't forget about my windows and weatherization. Um, I'm gonna keep talking about these windows till I leave office because I care so much about windows and a lot of the residents that I know of that are in need are seniors um, and that's my concern um, okay. to make sure that weatherization programs, talking to NYSERDA, um, Councilmember Diaz talked about uh, NYPERG. NYPERG is an environmentalist yeah. group, so maybe we can work with them on any opportunities. All I say is let's be creative. We can't sit back and wait for the federal government to foot the bill on everything. They will not do that, but that doesn't stop us from being creative and looking at other opportunities and partnerships that we can embark on to bring in the revenue that we need. Make Great. sense? That's Was that an accurate checklist? Did I, I, think I miss that's anything? A, a very accurate checklist. I didn't miss Council anything, member. right? Did I miss anything? Yeah. Just to make sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. Thank, Thank you, you really for appreciate having it. us. We will be in touch as we prepare for the executive budget and whatever happens between now and then. Um, thank you for your work. Thank you to the general manager. Thank you to our senior vice president, our CFO, and thank you to our chair. Thank you thank for your you. partnership. I appreciate it. And we look it. forward to working with you. Look, likewise. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.
Okay, we had two members of the public sign up, but they may have left. I probably talked too much. So let me see if they're here. Do we have JT Falcone from United Neighborhood Houses and Roxanne Delgado from Pelham Parkway Houses? If anyone's there or anyone else. Okay, I think they may have left. Okay, thank you everyone for coming today. Enjoy your weekend, be safe. Use every precaution to protect you and your family. This hearing of the preliminary budget of the Committee on Public Housing. Thank you to our chair who could not be here. I hope I did a good job filling her role. Thank you to Chair Alika Amprey Samuel. Thank you, Nyjah. Thank you, Sergeant at Arms. This hearing is hereby adjourned. Happy Friday.